uh, all like evolutionary game theory is real simple. Uh, so this is basically everything of evolutionary game theory in one slide, uh, and basically all of the all of the simulation, at least in terms of the Asian-based simulation type stuff, which I think is what the people here care about. Like everything that ever happened in all the evolutionary game theory is of the flavor. You define a game, which is you have some set of stat strategies and how those strategies translate into payoffs. You initialize a pop get you an agent, a population of agents, and you say what strategy each agent has, and then you just loop the same three steps, you know, a million times or ten million times or whatever. Which is everybody plays with each other get payoff as a result of their choices and the other people's choices. You pick one guy to die at random. You, you know, with some likely probability, you pick one agent proportional to payoff to reproduce and replace the dead guy. And with some small probability, instead you, a mutation happens and you pick a random uh, new strategy to replace the dead guy and you keep track of what happens. <clears throat> and that's all there is to it to all of evolutionary game theory. Uh, and as you might imagine, where all of the art and science is, is uh, in this step, the define the game step. Because once the game is defined, it's real straightforward to just say, all right, well, you know, basically, who's going to win? Or like, what are the good strategies going to be? So what I'm going to spend the, uh, the morning doing <coughs> is uh, talking more about this, and then talking more about this. Uh, but this is the basic roadmap, and uh, you know what, what's nice about this is that it's very easy. It's that it's simple, and it's also infinitely flexible in the sense that you can put whatever you want in the define the game step, and this is just an engine to say, assuming that agents reproduce proportional to fitness, what's going to happen? Okay, so. Uh, my understanding of what you guys talked about, uh, for the most part, for the, for the last few days, was what I would think of as individual choice problems, um, where you know people are trying to figure out what's the best option, and either there's a fixed bex option or the best option is changing over time in some way, uh, but like there's only one person making choices essentially, and the key to game theory is it's a language for describing social interactions, where instead of just one person making choices, you've got multiple people making choices, and how well one choice does depends on the choices that the other people make. Um, and so, what that means is that not the you know which option gets you the best payoff depends not just on you know nature, as they call it in game theory, which is everything that's not a decision maker, but instead it varies in response to what other people do. And the critical point is that other people's choices aren't random, but they're strategic in the same way that your own choice is strategic. And so you can figure out what are sets of choices that uh, seem likely to happen assuming everybody is being strategic. And uh, if we want to sort of understand these situations where you know, there are social interactions, you need some language for doing it. And basically what game theory is, is it's just a language for formally describing uh, social interaction. And, um, and I'll put all the slides on the thing off the internet. That's what that thing's called. Um, so you know, no need to frantically write down every word on the slides. Um, sorry, I just saw lots of people frantically typing. I, not that there's anything wrong with typing. I just wanted to clarify <laughs> that. Uh, Okay, so if game theory is a language for social interaction, uh, it works as follows. For any given interaction that you want to describe, you have to say, what is the set of players? And then each player has a set of choices. And then you say, you just, you, all you have to do is you have to stipulate, this is the payoff each player gets for each possible combination of choices by all the players. And once you've done that, you define your game, you're ready to plug it in to the top of that function from the first slide, and you're done. Um, and the, the reason that this is cool or the, is that uh, what it does is it gives you a way to distill whatever kind of complicated social interaction you want into some simple essence 
uh, in terms of players' choices and payoffs, and then see what happens. And there's sort of two broad different ways that this uh, gets used. One is theory, which is what I'll mostly focus on today, uh, which is using you know, various different uh, theoretical or computational approaches to say, once you've defined a game, what should happen? That is, what should you expect to see? And then there's also a big uh, uh, experimental literature using games to see, well, what actually happens when you have people play them? And I'll talk a little bit about uh, you know, some of this, but mostly I'm going to talk about the theory. OK, so the workhorse of, uh, of game theory is the payoff matrix, which you get your set of players and your set of choices and your payoffs for each player. And so a payoff matrix can be the definition for a game in general. So this is for a game that has two players, uh, and each player has the same two possible moves, call them strategy one and strategy two. And then the payoff matrix shows the payoff that each player gets as a result of each combination of moves. And so here, if both people, uh, and this is just a totally arbitrary payoff matrix, or totally general payoff matrix, that if both people choose strategy one, they both get W. If both people choose strategy two, they both get Z. Uh, but if one of them chooses strategy one and the other one chooses strategy two, the one that chooses strategy one gets X, and the one that chose strategy two gets Y. And this is a symmetric game, which is what I'm going to focus on today, which is to say uh, you know, it's symmetric. So uh, player one choosing strategy one and player two choosing strategy two, if instead it's flipped where player two chooses strategy one and player one chooses strategy two, it's the same payoffs, just reversed. So this is a two-player game. And to give a sample of it, uh, everybody's, or at least my favorite game, is The Prisoner's Dilemma, so great. Uh, I imagine most people know something about The Prisoner's Dilemma, but just to see how it works in this lovely format, if you define a Prisoner's Dilemma as saying, uh, you know, it's this model of cooperation, costly cooperation, and so say, for example, cooperation means paying a uh, cost of one unit, be it time, money, effort, whatever, in order to create three units of benefit for the other person, and defection means doing nothing, uh, then you can construct a payoff matrix where if player one, uh, yeah, okay, so we're gonna say, so you know, green is player one cooperating with player two, and blue is player two cooperating with player one, and so in the case that both of them cooperate, player one pays some cost to give the benefit to player two, and player two also pays that cost and gives the benefit to player one, and so they each get benefit minus cost, and assuming the benefit is greater than the cost, that's some good positive outcome. Uh, if both people defect, no one does anything and no one gets anything. Uh, but if, uh, and then say if player one cooperates, oh yeah, right, so the key point number one here is that mutual cooperation is better than mutual defection, because some benefit is created here and not there. But if you cooperate, if player one cooperates and player two doesn't, player one pays the cost and gives the benefit and doesn't get anything in return. And symmetrically, if player two cooperates and player one doesn't, player two pays the cost and player one gets the benefit. And so despite the fact that mutual cooperation is better than mutual defection, it's the case that no matter what your partner does, defection always earns you more than cooperation. Because if the other guy, co if the other guy cooperates, say you're player one, if the other guy cooperates, you get B minus C if you also cooperate, and you get B if you defect. If the other partner defects, you get uh, minus C if you cooperate, and zero if you defect. So because uh, defecting, I mean, cooperating requires paying this cost, you're always better off not cooperating. And the reason that this is so interesting is that these two things are in tension with each other, obviously, that you want the other guy to cooperate, but you don't want to cooperate. And so if both people follow self-interest, they both wind up worse off than if they both had been willing to uh, cooperate. So uh, right, this is just a sample of a payoff matrix capturing. And this, I would argue that this, this payoff matrix now captures a broad category of social interactions in which people have the opportunity to do things that are helpful to other people, but costly to themselves. Um, and you know, there's a huge literature analyzing this game in 10 million different ways to essentially say, how can we get into the cooperate, cooperate cell? Uh, and we'll talk about some of that later. 
you know, a path matrix matrices needn't be only two options. So here's a three. Uh, so each is still two players and symmetric, but now there's three different options, and so you just you know fill in all the spots. An example of that is rock paper scissors, uh, where as you may recall, uh, if both people play rock, it's a tie, so no one gets anything. Uh, rock loses to paper, so if, you, if player one plays rock and player two plays paper, player one gets minus one and player two gets plus one, and rock beats scissors, so if player one plays rock. Player two plays scissors, player one gets one, player two gets minus one, and so on. Um, and also, we won't talk about this that much, but uh, it doesn't need just to be payoff matrices. You can just have it more generally, it, you have a payoff function, which each agent has a strategy, and the payoff function somehow maps a choice by each agent into a payoff uh, for each agent. Uh, so for example, a sort of payoff function generalized version of a prisoner's dilemma could be each agent chooses some amount uh, to contribute between zero and one, uh, and then <clears throat> so a public goods game uh, is a you know a sort of continuous choice uh, prisoner's dilemma where the payoff that player one gets I'm going to use pi to donate payoff uh, to notate uh, payoff so the payoff of player one is the amount contributed by player one plus the amount contributed by player two, that is the total investment in the public good, times some factor, uh, and then minus the amount that player one contributed themselves. And this, you may note, has the same payoff structure as the prisoner's dilemma, where for player one, it's always personally costly to contribute, because for each unit you've put in, you lose one and you get back <laughs> 0.75, but when both people contribute, it makes them both better off. Okay, so uh, that's just a little intro to the basic idea of games. Um, and so once you've defined a game, the thing that now you want to know is, okay, what should we expect to happen in this game? And uh, the way economists usually think about this question is through prospective reasoning, which is to say, well, let me think about, I assume that I'm rational and self-interested, I'm gonna assume that the other person's rational and self-interested, and like, I'm gonna assume that they assume that about me, that is, and so on, that it's common knowledge that both of us are rational and self-interested, what would make sense for the other person to do and for me to do, and okay, that's what I expect to happen. Uh, and then the way the evolutionary biologist thinks about it, or the evolutionary theorist, let's say, is you've got some population, and you've got different strategies represented in the population, and they interact with each other, and then over time, uh, evolution happens, where the strategies that are doing better become more common, and the population evolves, and then the question is, where do I expect the population to wind up? And one uh, small note in terms of evolution, uh, that uh, usually when people talk about evolution, people think about genetic evolution, reproduction, and so on, uh, the three, and I should say the three components of evolution are you have to have variation within a population, then you have to have natural selection occurring on that variation such that some variants do better than others, and then you have to have, have mutation to maintain variation in the population. And so that can, could be genetic, where each agent has some set of genes, and sometimes the agents die, uh, and then well, sometimes the agents reproduce, and your genes determine how likely it is for you to reproduce, and then when mutations happen in the context of reproduction, sometimes the genes get messed up. Uh, but the exact same uh, concept, and for our purposes, the exact same math and computer code can implement instead what you might call cultural evolution or social learning, which is to say learning not through introspection, but by copying other people that seem to be doing well. And in that sense, each agent, or each agent has some strategy, which is their, you know, choices of how they're going to act. Sometimes agents decide to change their strategy, which is equivalent to dying in the genetic sense. Uh, and then when they change their strategy, they look around and they say, who's doing well? And they are more likely to adopt the strategies of people that are getting higher payoffs. And so that's the selection part. And then mutation here means uh, that uh, sometimes the strategy that the learner adopts is not actually the strategy that the teacher had. And either it could be a totally new random strategy, which could be something like innovation or experimentation, 
or it could be a somewhat slightly modified version of the teacher's strategy, which is more likely confusion or something like that. So my question was about that latter thing you talked about, uh, so maybe it's not as useful now, but I guess I was wondering how you implement that. So I was, I was gonna ask if that happens, is it the case that sometimes in either the genetic or cultural evolution side of things that you have a strategy that goes beyond what you've already specified, that is a new strategy that didn't exist previously? Um, and then if, if that is the case, how, how do you do that, especially in the genetic case? Uh, well, so in terms of the game theory sense, you have to specify the full set of possible strategies at the, you know, at the when you make the model. Yeah. But the in, in terms of the actual population, a strategy which doesn't currently exist in the population, mm -hmm. but is within the set of possible strategies, can be introduced through mutation. And you can think of there's sort of broadly two different classes of mutation. There's a global mutation. It's called when a mutant is just a totally randomly selected strategy from the whole set of possible strategies. Or there's local mutation, where the mutation is some perturbation off of the, uh, the parent. Um, and so I think actually one of the major issues with the whole game theoretic approach is that the set of strategies is necessarily defined at the outset. And so to the extent that you want to study things like real innovation, it's kind of hard in this paradigm because you can't ever really have a way that the agents can get outside of the set of strategies that are possible. I'll just point out that the very same problem occurs in Bayesian approaches to inference, that you can only do inference over the hypotheses that you have already entertained, but there's nothing contained within the Bayesian framework that allows you to construct a new hypothesis that wasn't in the original set of hypotheses and then give credence to it. And people have tried to come up with creative approaches to that, I'm sure they have in the game theory case as well, but to the first basic approximation, that's an issue that you face. Um, okay, so now, from either the perspective of the economist scratching their chin or the biologist reproducing, you want to know what are the behaviors that you should expect to occur. And the key so solution concept uh, that is really at the heart of basically all of game theory uh, is, uh, as featured in the movie, The Beautiful Mind, uh, <laughs> uh, the creation of John Nash, which is the Nash Equilibrium, and uh, in a two-player game, a given strategy is a Nash Equilibrium if it's the case that, given that the other person plays that strategy, you can't improve your payoff by playing anything else. Uh, that is to say, if both people are playing a, a given strategy, neither of them can improve their, their payoff by unilaterally switching, or unilaterally deviating, as they say in the biz. Um, and then same thing in a um, more than two player world, but if the economists always think about people paired up playing this, in the biological uh, version, it would be assuming that everyone else in the population is playing X, a strategy X, uh, it also maximizes your payoff to, to play X. And if you were to unilaterally deviate, it would decrease your payoff. And this is the definition for a strict Nash equilibrium. Uh, I guess that this is like a little bit of a, a detour, um, but like, whatever. I, feel, uh, I would feel negligent if I didn't do it. Actually, when I taught this class last semester, I didn't do it, and then I felt negligent. I had to go back three lectures later and do it. So I figured I'll just do it. So <coughs> uh, <coughs> um, there's actually, there's two different versions of Nash equilibrium. There's strict Nash equilibrium and there's regular old Nash equilibrium. And then there's also something called an evolutionarily stable strategy or ESS. And these things are very similar to each other. And I'm going to focus on the strict Nash uh, condition. Uh, but I'll just tell you how these three things relate to each other. So if you've got some arbitrary payoff matrix, uh, strategy A is a strict Nash. If So remember, the idea was if you know the other person is going to play A, then A is a Nash if you do better by playing A than by playing B. So that means you know, say you're player one, so you know player two is going to play A. Then if you play A, you'll get W. And if you switch to B, you'll get Y. So in order for A to be a strict Nash equilibrium, it has to be the case that W is greater than Y. 
So if you were to switch to B, you would be doing more orthogonal. Uh, great. But now there's also this concept uh, in, introduced by uh, Mann and Smith that was extremely similar as a biologist that was very similar to Nash equilibrium. And the idea here was something is an evolutionarily stable strategy if either W is greater than Y. Uh, oh, and I guess I should, should say that uh, the idea here is that rather than thinking about it in the um, economic sense of what is this other person going to do, whatever, Maynard Smith is thinking um, biologically, you have a population where everyone in the population has strategy X, and then a mutant arises, sorry, everyone has strategy A, and then a mutant arises that has strategy B, is that mutant going to be able to take over? And so if W is greater than Y, then when that mutant is first arises, everybody else in the population is playing A, he switches to B, he's doing worse, he'll die out. So that would be evolutionarily stable. Or it could be the case that W is equal to Y, so when the mutant is rare, and so it's, B is only playing with A players, it does just as well as A players. But as B becomes more common, and therefore there are sometimes A players uh, meeting B players. That is, if you think of a world where the whole population is A and you put in one B player, then basically the A players are only ever other meeting, meeting other A players, and this one B guy is always meeting an A player. But like, as B gets more common, uh, it, then sometimes A has to play with B, and so it says, okay, if B does uh, and A do just as well against A, then A has to beat B when playing against B. And so that would make something evolutionarily stable, and then there's the weak Nash, which is, you could say that A is a weak Nash if W is greater than or equal to Y. And so there, it's not that you necessarily decrease your payoff by switching, but it's that you can't improve your payoff by switching. And so as you may notice, <coughs> these three conditions are nested such that uh, you have a set of things that are a strict Nash. Everything that is a strict Nash is definitely an ESS, but some ESS are not strict Nash. And then every ESS is definitely a regular old Nash, but some regular old Nash aren't ESS. And like uh, regular means weak. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, weak. Right. Um, that is, in general, when someone says Nash equilibrium, the thing that you assume is this sort of weak condition. But uh, as someone interested in evolutionary stability, uh, I like the strict condition. So I'm going to sort of focus on strict. But just so if someone, like a lot of times people will use Nash and ESS more or less interchangeably because they are very similar. So, uh, any questions about this? Okay, so <clears throat> that was a, a, a brief digression there. Um, and so everyone's obsessed with Nash and you might wonder why we care so much about this idea. Uh, and so both from the perspective of prospective reasoning and of evolution, it's the real important thing. So, uh, you know, if I assume that the other person is rational and self-interested, and so you wonder what maximizes my payoff, then you can say, well, I know that if we're in a Nash equilibrium, if we're both trying to maximize our payoffs, then this is something where neither of us can do better by switching, and so this is something that could be a stable equilibrium outcome that we could expect to see. And the evolution version is, as I said in the last slide, in a, in a population where everyone has a given strategy, could a mutant have an advantage? And if the, if the resident strategy is Nash, then any possible mutant will do worse and won't be able to invade. <clears throat> and also a cool uh, feature is that, uh, oh yeah, and so I guess I should say, when people, non-economists like to make fun of the Nash equilibrium, uh, it's usually in the context of the thing that is assumed of this prospective reasoning and assumptions, common knowledge of rationality and all that stuff is totally unrealistic and obviously not what people are doing. And so therefore Nash must be a dumb uh, concept and why does everybody care about it? And the like, amazing thing is that <clears throat> not in all cases, but in general, the totally mindless process of evolution will always converge to Nash equilibrium. Um, and virtually any learning dynamic that causes strategies that are doing, that sort of focuses on strategies that are doing better will converge to Nash equilibria. Uh, and so even though this kind of rational prospective motivation that was originally attached to it is not 
of sort of particularly relevant seeming thing, that criteria is super useful because it turns out to be super general that all different kinds of dynamics basically converge to Nash equilibria. And so that's why in a lot of cases, just by calculating Nash equilibria from a game, you've already learned a lot about uh, what you can expect to happen. Okay, so I'm just gonna do a couple of quick uh, more examples. Well, I don't know. Uh, show of hands for who would like to do some examples of Nash equilibria in games versus, um, well, whatever. I guess I'll just do it because it also teaches about some of the kinds of games that are cool. Okay, so this is our prisoner's dilemma um, from before where uh, cooperation means paying a cost C to give a benefit B to the other person and defecting means doing nothing. Uh, and so we can say, what's in equilibrium here? Is, is C a Nash? Well, uh, if player one were to unilaterally deviate from C to D, uh, she would improve her payoff. And if player two you know, similarly were to switch, she would improve her payoff. So no, that is not in equilibrium because both players can improve their payoffs by switching. Is uh, defection in equilibrium? Uh, well, if you switch to cooperating when, while the other guy's defecting, you do worse. Uh, so neither person has an incentive to deviate. So yes, uh, defection is a Nash. And here it was where you see the unilateral feature of it. Because if both people were to switch, they would be better off. But by the Nash is all about the unilateral deviation. And actually, fun fact, the prisoner's dilemma was invented more or less as a way to show that Nash equilibrium was a dumb solution concept. <laughs> because it leads you to a choice that obviously doesn't make any sense. Um, but uh, it's, well, whatever. Hmm? Is it better to think about payoff matrices as three-dimensional three when each player is a 2D matrix? Because every time I see it with a comma, like, it, just, it throws me off. But it's really just like two pages, right? So the, the comma, like evolutionary game theorists basically only ever study symmetric games. And in symmetric games, you don't actually need the comma because you can always just figure out what the other person's payoff is by looking in a symmetric oh, bin. Okay. Uh, that is, I could have gotten rid of all the commas and it just said B here and minus C here. And so if you want to know how's the other guy doing when I do this, well, you just look in the, you know, the sort of symmetric cell. But uh, economists have locked, like, light a lot of the time asymmetric games, in which case you need to show it this way. And, yeah. So why this is why do biologists not like asymmetrical games <coughs> like economists are fond of them? Uh, because when you think about, I mean, this is just my sociological uh, theory here, but I think it's that when you think about a population, uh, you are. It's it's typically the case that like, you know, you're seeing you're seeing a mixing of lots of different people. Sorry, let me try and say this differently. So. In the, if you just think about two people having an interaction, you want to say in this pair of interactions, like what are outcomes you could expect? They can be to in totally different roles, doing you know different things, whatever. It's fine. You just want to say what agreement essentially are these two people going to come to, or what outcome are these two people going to come to? But when you think about a thing within a population, you have all of the different agents interacting with each other, and then a frequency of a strategy changing within the population. And so if you have different roles, then you have to sort of separate those into two different populations so that people are only competing with each other within roles. I don't know, whatever. That, that wasn't very coherent, uh, I feel like. So a, In the domain of like, sexual selection and things like that, there actually are a lot of, uh, biologists do care a lot about um, asymmetric games, and also asynchronous games, where like one mover goes first. And, like, I don't know if they're going to talk about like, signaling and stuff like that. But you, I mean, you know, if you have any familiarity with literature on sexual selection, a lot of the ideas are driven by the observation that, in general, women carry greater costs for childbearing than men do for appropriation. And that asymmetry leads to various interesting consequences. But, uh, but uh, basically, the issue is that when you have asymmetric games, then you have to have two separate populations in the sense that you only can have sort of selection operating within, basically, you typically have people in one role competing with each other, and then people in the other role competing with each other. Um, well, whatever. Um, so, okay, so, so in this case, you have defection is the only possible equilibrium, um, but this is not the only game that you could imagine. For example, it could be the case that uh, in order to get 
the benefit of cooperation to occur, you need both people to cooperate. And so if you defect while the other person cooperates, no benefit gets created, <clears throat> which is basically the same thing, except I set these where you get the benefit if I'm defecting while the other person cooperates, we just set it to zero. Uh, and now all of a sudden, uh, it's a different game. Some examples of this uh, are like the stag hunt, uh, is, a, is a classical version where you can sort of, here defecting is going uh, to hunt some like small crappy thing like a hare, I think, that you can catch perfectly well on your own. Uh, and cooperating is trying to catch a stag, which is like a bigger, better thing to get, but you can only catch the stag if both people to cooperate. So if one guy goes to catch the stag, while well, the other guy goes to hunt the hare, uh, you know, there's, it's not like the guy that hunts the hare gets a share of the stag anyways, it's just no stag gets caught. Uh, and another version of it that my friend Matthias von Velen uh, proposed is the rock band game. Uh, that's Dave Rand circa 2005, I think. Uh, and so the idea of the rock band game is uh, in, in the rock band, either you can practice your instrument and get good, or you can slack off. Uh, and the band is going to suck unless everybody practices. So these are coordination games where, in order to benefit, the benefit only gets produced when everyone cooperates. Sorry, which one are you? <laughs> oh, uh, this one. Sorry. Why is he holding the mic for you? Cooperation, man. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this dude now works at Rand Corporation, uh, doing uh, policy analysis. That uh, dude's a city planner. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, anyways. Presumably uh, one of you can afford a mic stand by this time. Yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not as cool. <laughs> See, the problem, with the, the problem with the rock band analogy for punk rock bands is that in punk rock bands, you're not supposed to practice. <laughs> uh, anyways, OK. So uh, this creates a, uh, a coordination game, it's called. Because now you say, OK, is cooperating Nash? Well, if. Uh, if given that the other guy is going to cooperate, if I switch to defecting, I don't have to pay the cost, but I also don't get the benefit anymore. So it's not actually, it's a bad idea to switch. Uh, and so that means that cooperating is a Nash equilibrium, the way it wasn't in, in the, uh, in the <coughs> prisoner's dilemma, although it's still also the case that defecting is an equilibrium. And so here you want to coordinate because it's like doing, matching what the other person does is an equilibrium. You just it doesn't, you know, either one is an equilibrium, you just got to all be on the same page. <clears throat> and now, one more example of a canonical game is the snowdrift game. Uh, and so, the idea of the snowdrift is you imagine two cars are driving home on a wintry evening and they find the road blocked by a snowdrift. And so, now the question is do you get out and shovel uh, or do you stay warm in your car? And <clears throat> the key thing here is that. Uh, if the other guy is going to get out and shovel, it's better for you to stay in your car and stay warm. Uh, and so in that sense, it's like a prisoner's dilemma where uh, you defecting while the other guy cooperates is better than, for you than both cooperating. But unlike the prisoner's dilemma, if the other guy is not going to get out and shovel, better for you to get out and shovel than just sit in your car all night long. And so... Uh, it, you can imagine a payoff structure where this means that it, in, when both people cooperate, the cost is shared between them because you know you get through the thing twice as quickly. Um, and but also the benefit of getting through the snowdrift gets produced regardless of whether one or both people get up, get out and shuffle because both ways you manage to get home. And so here it's like the prisoner's dilemma, but now uh, you. Uh, so when both people cooperate, the cost is divided by two. And in the case where one guy cooperates and the other one defects, it used to be B and minus C. But now the guy that gets out and shovels still gets the benefit because he gets to go home. Um, and some cool biological example or some cool sort of world examples of this. One is this cool thing with yeast. This is from this dude Jeff Gore at MIT. Uh, and so yeast are little single-celled organisms. They look like this in a microscope. And uh, in addition to making beer, they uh, excrete an enzyme called invertase uh, that allows that uh, there's, they can only take up certain kinds of sugars that are like one unit, and they're like in environments where there's only dimers of that sugar. They create this enzyme 
they excrete it outside of the cell and it cleaves the dimer into individual units that then the yeast can uh, uptake. But that means there's some public good element of this because if you had a mutant strain of yeast that didn't uh, invest in creating that enzyme, as long as there was lots of other yeast around creating the enzyme, they can free ride off of the sugar getting produced. But in an environment where nobody's producing the, the enzyme, it's better to make the enzyme so you can get the sugar, otherwise you're all gonna die. And so he shows that basically you get the evolution of cooperation here because it's a snow drift game. Um, and another version is voting in that like, you don't need everybody to vote in order to have good you know, functioning dem democracy. You just need enough people to vote. And so if you know every other person is definitely gonna vote, whatever. There's not really any point in you voting, but if basically nobody's voting, then it becomes important. Uh, and so this is an anti-coordination game because if you know the other guy is going to cooperate, you do better to defect than to cooperate. So cooperation is not in equilibrium. Uh, but if you know that the other person is going to defect, then you do better to switch to cooperation, uh, and which means that defection is also not in equilibrium. So there's no pure equilibrium. That is neither everyone playing C nor everyone playing D uh, is an equilibrium here. Okay, so this is I put in a few like little uh, breakpoints in the flow of this thing. Where so now I feel like that's my introduction to games and game theory, and then the next section is going to be starting to talk about dynamics and evolutionary dynamics uh, and so on. So any questions or whatever at this point? Mm -hmm. So what, it, what would it mean, going back to payoff matrices, for a matrix not to be symmetrical? Would it be like the players have different abilities or have different amounts of knowledge about the payoffs of their strategy? So usually what it means, so it could be that. That is, it could be that there are different types of players, and so everyone is playing the same game, but some people are better or worse at it. Mm -hmm. And so like in a lot of costly signaling theory, the idea is you have like high quality types and low quality types. And so you could imagine in the context of cooperation, like for some types it's more expensive, that is it's harder to produce the benefit, or some types get more benefit out of being helped than others. So that's one way that, that it could work. Or it could be that there's totally different roles. So like in the ultimatum game, you know, it's a game where there's some amount of money and player one proposes a split of that money and then player two either accepts it or rejects it. And so that game's asymmetric, not just in the payoffs, but also in the set of options. Where player one's option is, you know, fair offer, unfair offer, and player two's uh, choice set is accept all offers or like reject low offers. And then you can make a payoff matrix where the, you know, the choices are different and the payoffs are different. Oh, got it. I have another question. <laughs> um, so when you say that uh, learning algorithms will converge on Nash, mm -hmm. does that mean that if players begin not knowing what game they're playing and connect this a little bit with reinforcement learning if they were to just try out different strategies and uh, update their key values on, on different strategies. Yeah. Eventually they would learn the game and, yeah. and uh, you, the, the, the equilibrium would be the same. I it would reach that, the ground truth. I believe that that's right. Do you know, is that is that a general, I'm pretty sure Moshe told me that one time. That like Moshe all, has said that to me many times. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've gotten more complicated answers out of my volition and Adam yeah. might be the person who knows best. It's, yeah, well, I'm, Michael Levin's the one I trust the most on this. Yeah. Uh, and he said it's basically complicated. Um, <laughs> it's usually, like, off, like, as a first pass, they do most of the time. And, so, and, and that's also the fair answer about evolution, which yes. is it's complicated, but, like, the basic, the, the, the principal the, component. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. That is basically yes, but not always. Okay. All right. um, uh, and at least in the context of evolution, the way it works is if you have sort of simple classical dynamics that don't have noise and randomness in them, like things will for sure converge to Nash equilibria. But if you have lots of errors and noise in the learning, you can get qualitatively different things to happen, um, which was in grad school, one of the things I worked a lot on, showing how you can get cool things happening when you have a lot of noise in the learning. Let me just make three remarks on this. One is, is worse than useless, which is when Michael Lippmann talks about this, the concept of the subgame and I don't know whether that's part of the answer about what computer science can guarantee versus not. Oh, 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 yeah. So also, uh, so I should say, when I say Nash equilibria, I mean subgame perfect Nash equilibria. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. That is, anyway. that's yeah. the one refinement that everyone has accepted as just like, if it's not subgame perfect, like whatever. So. What does that mean? Like, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, it's not. It's not. I, I told you my answer was going yeah. to this. <laughs> so, so let me just jump right yeah. into this. Because I would basically say talk to Dave later or do some reading or something. But not going to. Second right. thing is, let me just point out that in the final exercise that you guys did on Monday, you had multiplayer blackjack. So blackjack is a game, and it's going to have, and it might not be a very interesting match, you will I'm not sure how dependent it is on the other player's moves, but you could certainly attempt to analyze what the Nash solution to blackjack is and then find out whether your multiplayer or RL game converged on it. It's, it's a little tricky because the in the version we did in standard blackjack, the dealer doesn't have a choice. With the right, which makes it not a game. Force. But okay, so then, so fine. So make it a freely acting dealer. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and then you do that. I'm not sure, that, again, that blackjack is going to be the most interesting case of a multiplayer of a game. But anyway, and, and then the final remark is if you have an intuition about where you think Q -learn, two Q learners won't converge on Nash, sweet project for the next few days. Mm -hmm. Go, you know, use the methods that Dave taught you to compute the Nash. Um, code up the reinforcement learning agents and find out. Yeah, totally. Other? Uh, can, you, can you go to the previous slide? So this is similar to the yeast example that you showed, right? Yep. And there you said, like, that work shows that they basically come up with the strategy of cooperation. But here you don't have stable Nash equilibrium. <coughs> But then you said that evolution ultimately goes to the Nash equilibrium. In the next section, uh, this will be this okay. will be addressed. Um, also on that game, um, if we like had like let's say like a, a like a soup making game where if you have like too many cooks, the benefit gets cut in half, mm -hmm. the costs. Would you see a Nash equilibrium then on like the asymmetric like cooperating effect? Or yeah, so so it's a good point that if we are allowing uh, non-symmetric outcomes, that is, one person cooperates and the other person defects, that is an equilibrium in this game. Um, and in general, those are what I would think of as like, uh, if you have diminishing marginal returns on the benefit, it's 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 like a snowdrift. Um, but what you're going to see in the next section when you put in a population context, it's not that you have this sort of like asymmetric. Uh, Nash is not the thing that matters, but I guess the answer to both your questions is what you wind up getting is evolution favoring coexistence within a population where some fraction of the po people in the population are playing one strategy and the rest of them are playing the other strategy. And so that's what you would get in that kind of thing, and that's what you get in the yeast uh, situation. When you're talking about the cultural uh, version, mm -hmm. implementation level, is there any So the standard approach uh, is just exactly the same model, exactly the same math, and just a different story that has different words attached to it when you're describing it. But uh, people that sort of take the cultural stuff more seriously, uh, like Joe Henrik um, and Rob Boyd, uh, you, you can make modifications. That is, when you do it just with exactly the same math, you're making certain strong assumptions, like people only copy proportional to payoff, like others proportional to payoff, and when people mutate, they pick at random. And so uh, you could do things where you could say, well, in, in, con in cultural learning, to some extent you care about payoff, but also like conformity is a thing, so you might copy strategies just because they're common, not necessarily because they're doing well, and when mutations happen, that is, uh, if you think that it's mutations through errors, then it should be kind of more like local mutation. Uh, and if you assume that it's uh, errors, uh, it's, it's, sorry, if you assume that it's variation due to experimentation, the simple thing here is you just assume that when a mutation happens, there's a uniform distribution over all possible strategies that they select from. But you can imagine that instead, there's some kind of bias where people are more likely to innovate with, higher, with strategies that would do better in the current environment. And so you could have more comp computated mutation kernels, as they call it, that would better reflect uh, you know, how innovation works or something like that. 
But in general, the way it's done is you just use the exact same math and say, yeah, this could be cultural evolution or genetic evolution. <laughs> Everybody signed my paper. <laughs> uh, okay. So, Nash equilibrium is a static concept, which is to say that uh, it is a statement about when things should not change. That is, if you're in a Nash equilibrium, things shouldn't change. And also it's static in that it's, you're just taking a matrix and you're doing some calculation and saying, hey, this is where things should be. Um, but uh, most of the time, what we're actually interested in a fundamental level is the dynamics. That is to say, how a population changes over time, how the frequency of strategies in a population change over time. Um, and so if in a game where there's only one Nash equilibrium, like you could say in some sense, the dynamics don't really matter that much because at least uh, you know, in the long run, uh, there's no question about what's gonna happen. If one strategy is strictly dominant, no matter where the population starts in terms of frequency of strategies, it's in the long run gonna wind up with just the dominant strategy dominating. Uh, so there, maybe evolution or you know, dynamics are not that important. Uh, but in situations where there's more than one Nash equilibrium, uh, or in situations where there's no Nash equilibria, then the dynamics matter. Uh, and the essential uh, way that the question works is you can say, if you, if, if you tell me the current state of the population, that is the current frequency of strategies in the population, what I want to know is what's going to happen. Uh, which equilibrium it's going to wind up in, if there are multiple equilibria, and if there are no equilibria, just more generally, well, shit, what's going to happen? Um, and so uh, evolutionary game theory answers these questions using the principle of natural selection. And I should say that like, you know, this is just one of many possible dynamics. And the stuff that you talked about in the previous uh, days are other examples of ways to answer this question. Uh, that you could use reinforcement learning like as a way to say, well, given that I've got a certain you know, set of strategies and payoffs, the, everyone could just be doing reinforcement learning and that would be another way of seeing how frequencies change in the population. Uh, and so evolutionary game theory's choice is natural selection, which again, the way that I mostly think about it is rather than either introspection or considering of what you've done in the past, you know, experimenting and saying what went well, this is about social learning, looking around and saying, who else is doing well let me do the thing that the other people are doing. And so uh, if we are going to think about a two strategy game, and so we've got some population, and we say that fraction p of the population is using strategy one, and fraction one minus p is using strategy two, uh, then you have the question of, OK, fine. Say that an offspring is produced. What type is it going to be? And the higher here payoff is in units of reproductive success. Uh, and so the idea is the higher the payoff of strategy one, the more likely the offspring is strategy one and vice versa for strategy two. And so what that means is you want to say, is the frequency of strategy one increasing or decreasing? It's going to depend on the relative payoff of these two agents. And if the payoff of strategy one is greater than strategy two, strategy one is more likely to reproduce. Strategy one becomes more frequent in the population, he increases. Uh, and uh, you know, but and now and so this is the point at which, like, up until here, this is like, you know, fine. Then one strategy is going to do better and it's going to win. But where the whole thing gets interesting, the game part, is that because the payoffs depend on what everybody else is doing, uh, now that the frequency of strategies in the population has changed, the payoffs of the agents change. And so it's possible that the strategy that was doing well last time is no longer doing well now because who they're playing against has changed. Um, and you know, if the opposite, that you know, if strategy one is doing worse than strategy two, then P decreases and payoffs change and so on. Uh, and so an equilibrium is reached when, if you get to a place where the expected payoff of the two different strategies is the same, then you're in equilibrium because both strategies are equally likely to reproduce. And so uh, the frequency of the one versus the other doesn't change. And so p doesn't change. And so once you've reached a place where both strategies get equal payoffs, then you would expect to remain at that frequency forever. 
Um, and I should say that there's, so that's one way that you can uh, have the population not change. And the other way is if you get to a population that is entirely one strategy or entirely the other strategy, then also the population is never going to change because there's no variation to act on anymore because everyone is doing the same thing. So if you're looking around, well, who should I imitate? Everybody's doing the same thing, and so you're going to wind up uh, you know, doing that same thing. Don't you still have mutations? Yes. Except for mutation. <laughs> and so this is why mutation is really important, is that it, it, it reintroduces variation. Um, and so what that means is either if you're on one of the edges where you know, everyone is doing one strategy or everyone is doing the other strategy, or if you're at an interior point where both of the two strategies are getting the same payoff, and so you're in one of these uh, two different types of equilibria, uh, when mutation happens, that will push you out of the equilibrium, not you, it will push the population slightly out of the equilibrium. And so the key question in terms of evolutionary stability is uh, when you get pushed out of an equilibrium, uh, what happens? Uh, do you return immediately to the equilibrium or do you then, does the population then evolve off in some other direction? And the key concept that we care about is identifying uh, makeups of the population that are evolutionarily stable, where if you get perturbed off of the equilibrium, you come back. And so that, because that means that's a place that you would expect the population to spend a long time. If you have something where if you're right on it, uh, you know, neither strategy has an advantage, but the minute you get perturbed a little bit off, it goes off in some other direction, then you don't expect the population to really spend any time hanging out there. And so the business of evolutionary game theory is identifying these stable outcomes. Uh, uh, and, and specifically what I mean is that when you're at an equilibrium uh, and then a mutation increases the frequency of one strategy or the other, uh, if it's stable, that means that the mutant has a lower payoff than the strategy, the resident, that is the strategy of all the sort of you know, non-mutants, and therefore that mutant dies out uh, and gets pushed, and so the population moves back to where it was before the mutant arose, which means things will be stable. But if the mutant does better, then things will continue to move in the direction uh, that, the, that the mutant came from, and things will, uh, will change. And so this is uh, like how it gets back to the Nash equilibrium uh, concept. Okay, so uh, right, and this, so this evolutionary stability is what we want to say, identifying places where the population will actually stay there uh, despite mutations. Um, okay, so to see a little bit uh, how this works getting into actual dynamics, now we need to calculate our payoffs and uh, in the Nash equilibrium, it was very easy because you were only ever considering one person playing with one other person. And so you can say, for sure I know that player one is going to play A, what should I do? Or for sure I know the other player one is going to play B, what should I do? But now you have a population of different agents interacting with each other. And so what we're going to start with is the simplifying assumption, which is we just assume everybody plays the game once with everybody else, and your payoff is average payoff over all of those interactions. Um, this is what we call a well-mixed population because just everyone is equally mixing. Um, and so for our arbitrary payoff matrix, uh, this means that the, uh, and, and remember we're saying that P is the fraction of population that's using strategy one. That means that our expected payoffs are just for player one with probability P, they meet someone else playing probability one and they get W. With probability one minus p, they meet someone playing strategy two and they get x. <coughs> and you know, for strategy two, it's y and z. Mm -hmm. So um, when you make this simplifying assumption, the first thing that I thought was, that's weird. What if you interact with each person more than once and yet still an equal number of times? Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, well, maybe you're just multiplying through by a constant, mm -hmm. so that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But then the next thing that I thought was, well, wait a minute. Everybody knows that they're there's different solutions to a one-shot versus repeated prisoner dilemma, for instance. Does that, but maybe that's just irrelevant to this assumption? Can you clarify? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so 
the one-shot versus repeated prisoner's dilemma, which we may talk about if time uh, permits, is that's changing what the game is that's being played. I see. And here it's just saying, well, whatever, the game is. whatever the game is, we just assume that you play it equally likely with everyone, and if you assume that you play that same game 10 times with each person, as you said, it's just multiplying all the payoffs through by 10, and because you only, compare, you only care about how payoffs compare to each other, so that just, cancels just to out. say that again, if I was modeling a repeated PB, the assumption everyone interacts once means everyone plays the repeated PB once. Right, with each other. But it has many rounds. Yes, Got right, it. exactly. Um, right. And so uh, now that you have a definition of payoffs, you can just like let evolution happen. So if we do our prisoner's dilemma, say we start out in a population where we've got these 20 people and they're all cooperating, about 21 people, fine. Uh, then everybody plays the game 20 times with the other 20 people, and every time everybody gets B minus C, so their expected payoff is B minus C, and this is an equilibrium because there's no variation to act on. So the population would stay here forever if mutation didn't occur. But now imagine that this guy gets struck by lightning and turns into a defector. Now all of a sudden, you've got 20 cooperators and one defector. And so now the cooperators pay off. So they're for sure paying the cost, because no matter what the other guy does, no matter what the other guy does, the cooperator is always paying the cost. And 19 out of 20 times, they get the benefit back from their partner but one out of the 20 times they meet this defector and they don't get any benefit back. Uh, and this uh, defector never pays any cost, and every time it meets somebody, they cooperate with him, so his payoff is just B. And uh, as you may see, B, no matter what the values of B and C are, as long as they're positive, and we assume B is greater than C, although it doesn't even really matter here, uh, the defector is going to be doing better than the cooperators. And so, uh, that means that this is not going to be a stable equilibrium because the defector is going to take over. Uh, and so if now the way the dynamic works is you randomly pick one agent to change strategy, and then she picks another agent proportional to payoff to imitate, and she's more likely to pick the defector than one of the cooperators because the defector is doing better. Uh, and now the payoff of the cooperators is going down. Interestingly, the payoff of the defectors is also going down because the only way pay to payoff gets generated is through cooperation. But it's still the case that the defectors are doing better than the cooperators. And so eventually, you know, if you follow this logic, everyone's going to switch to a defector, and everybody's going to have payoff zero. And so here we see evolution and natural selection functioning to reduce population fitness in its effort to increase individual uh, fitness. Because, yeah, that's the whole. That's the crux of the evolution of cooperation. Um, OK. And uh, now we're back to a situation where the whole population is defection. And so this is an equilibrium, because there's no variation to work on. But uh, the question is, is it a stable equilibrium or not? And so now imagine that this guy gets struck by lightning and turns into a cooperator. That is, a mutation occurs. Uh, now we're back to a situation where the cooperators get just paying the cost and not getting any benefit back, and all the defectors are getting a little bit of benefit. And so here, the cooperator is doing worse than the defectors, and so it's going to die out. And so this defection is a stable equilibrium. And it's like saying, you know, mutual defection is a Nash. It's, you know, all these things connect. Uh, so that's the basic idea. Uh, the way you can represent this is to say that um, in this two strategy case, you can represent all possible population makeups with a line where uh, on this end, p equals 0, so everyone is playing strategy 2. On this end, p equals 1, everybody's playing strategy 1. In the middle, it's 50 50. And so any makeup of the population is just some point on this line. And so you want to say, is S1 evolutionarily stable? That is to say, if at p equals 1, so if everyone in the population is playing S1, uh, and one mutant arose that switched to S2, would that have an advantage? Uh, which is to say, when you're right down at near the S1 end, what is the direction of movement that's of, of selection along this line? Is it the case that uh, S2 is doing better and so selection is moving the population this way? Or is it that S1 is doing better, in which case selection is moving the population this way? 
Uh, and that's like saying at the point where the whole population is, is playing strategy one, which guy has a better payoff? And if, as you recall, we said that the payoffs are just, you know, P times W plus one minus P times X or P times Y plus one minus P times Z, uh, then you just plug in P equals one and saying that S equal, you know, and so if you plug in P equals one here, this just becomes W, this becomes Y. And so asking, does strategy one do better than strategy two when strategy one is the only thing that exists, collapses just back to the Nash equilibrium condition of saying, is strategy one an equilibrium? And you, know, you can see the logic of saying is, if everybody else in the population is playing S1, uh, does S1 do better than S2? Is the same thing as saying, given that you know for sure your partner plays S1, can you improve your payoff by switching? Which gets you back to the same Nash condition. Uh, so that's the sort of connection between the dynamical systems kind of stability thing on the edges and the, and the Nash concept. And so uh, if you think about this sort of evolutionarily, evolutionary flow along this uh, population makeup, <clears throat> with two strategies, there's only three possible things that could ever happen. One possibility is everywhere along the line, one strategy does better than the other. Um, in which case we would say that uh, you know, and so this would be this means that no matter what uh, the other guy is doing, strategy one is uh, I guess in this case, well I guess I have it backwards. Sorry. Oh no, yeah, I did it right. Okay. So that means that uh, W is greater than Y and X is greater than Z. So no matter what the other guy does, strategy one is always winning. Uh, and so in this case, there's only one Nash equilibrium, which is strategy one. And this is called dominance. So strategy one dominates strategy two because everywhere it wins. Um, and this is like defection dominates cooperation in the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, but another possibility is that uh, when strategy one is common, so when you're down near this end, strategy one does better than strategy two, which is like the dominance case. But when strategy two is common, then strategy two does better than strategy one. Uh, and so here, both of these things are equilibria. Uh, and that means that there is going to necessarily be some point in the middle. So down on this end, strategy two is doing better. Down on this end, strategy one is doing better. So by continuity, there has to be some point in between where the two of them are doing exactly equally well. And that also uh, is an equilibrium. Right, because both strategies are doing equally well. But we can know that for sure this is going to be an unstable equilibrium. Because if you look, about, look at the direction of flow, say you're right here and a mutation takes you one step in this direction, then it's going to push you all the way down to strategy two. If you take one step in this direction, it's going to push the population all the way to strategy one. And so that is unstable, whereas these two equilibria are stable. And so this is equivalent to a situation where, okay, well, so what does it mean? I was going to say it's equivalent to both of these being equilibria, which you can see by saying, what does it mean for, we already saw when strategy one is, well, basically when the whole population is strategy one, for strategy one to be doing better, that means W has to be greater than Y. And in a population where it's all strategy two, then strategy two has to be doing better, which means that Z has to be greater than x. So if z has to be greater than x, that you don't have an incentive to, to switch on either end, um, which means that this is the sort of dynamical uh, uh, consequence of what happens in a coordination game. And this is called bistability, because you have two possible stable outcomes. Uh, and which one you wind up in depends on where you start. Um, and so, uh, I'll just say one more thing about this class of uh, situations where you have two equilibria and this coordination situation, which is what we, so like I said, where you wind up depends on where the population starts. Because if you have, if you're anywhere in this region, then you wind up, you know, it evolves to the whole population being dominated by strategy one. Anyone, anywhere in here, it evolves to the whole population being dominated by strategy two. And so, uh, the technical term now is the basin of attraction. So like this is 
the basin of attraction for strategy one, because anywhere in there it gets attracted to strategy one. This is the basin of attraction for strategy two. And so you can think of the equilibrium that has the larger basin of attraction is in some sense more robust because it's more likely that the population is going to wind up there because there's just more initial uh, conditions that draw you to it. And so uh, and another way of saying it is like if you don't know anything about where the population starts and you have to guess which equilibrium you're going to wind up in, the one that has the bigger basin of attraction is the one that you would guess. And uh, so, you know, for example, if it's like this, you're more likely to, to wind up in strategy two than in strategy one. If, the, if this sort of interior equilibrium, as it's called, is exactly at 0.5, then these two guys have the same size basin of attraction, so you're equally likely to wind up in either. Uh, and so uh, a sort of shorthand for knowing uh, which strategy is going to do, wh sorry, which equilibrium, which stable equilibrium is going to do better, is to say, uh, you want to know which one has the big, bigger basin of attraction, but uh, the, way that, uh, the way that you can see that is by saying, if you are at 0.5, which strategy is winning? Um, and so this concept from economics, uh, they also care about this for slightly different reasons. They call it risk dominance. This is you know, one of the annoying features of game theory, although I guess this is probably true of all fields, is there are all these things that somebody made a name up for once, and now it's called that, even though like, it's not at all obvious why that is the thing. I remember for like two years at the baby grad school, I heard people talking about risk dominance, and I had no idea what it was, and I had assumed it had something to do with risk, or perhaps <laughs> dominance. Uh, but in fact, it's just saying, uh, when both strategies are equally likely, which one does better? Um, and so the economics version is saying, assuming that you don't know anything about what your partner is going to do, so you would just assume 50-50 chance she chooses one versus the other option, which does better. But it's uh, the sort of strategic equivalent to this idea of saying which of the equilibria has a bigger size basin of attraction. Mm -hmm. I know the math would be more complicated, but these same basic principles apply to describing uh, games with more than two strategies. So for sure, the idea that the basic principle of like uh, you have, you know, you have this dynamics and an, if, uh, an outcome is going to be a stable equilibrium if any mutation perturbed off of it does worse. Um, that is a totally general thing. Uh, the concept of bi-stability only makes sense in a game of two ga strategies because of the word bi. You can imagine like a like a version. Yes, you could have tri-stability. Yeah. It's just, you know, yeah. So, right, and, and it, that is in general uh, the, the key question, oh, oh, sorry, the other thing that's totally general is when you have multiple equilibria, no matter how many you have, you're most likely to wind up in the one that has the biggest basin of attraction, or just more generally, the bigger the size of the basin of attraction of an equilibrium is, the more likely you're gonna wind up there. Oh, sorry, I think I already said. So, uh, maybe I'm taking the analogy too seriously, but if you think about a two-dimensional representation of the basin of attraction, it has width and also depth, and risk dominance seems to only be focusing on width. What's right? the two? What are the two dimensions? Well, it's a, it's it's the basin. I'm, look, I'm thinking of a picture of a basin. Here's a picture of a basin. Uh, yeah, but it's there. There is no other dimension. Sorry, There's hold. No let me go dimension. back to this thing. That is because remember, if you have only two strategies, the population is one-dimensional. It's just what is the frequency of one strategy? But the payoffs are giving are it's a it's a property of the relative payoffs which would give depth. I see. And so the so the question so here, here's an example. So suppose I have two extremely powerful magnets, and I have a space where they're going to engage in random drift. Okay? okay. In most of the space, the attraction can't overcome inertia or friction or whatever. Okay. But once they make it together, they're so powerful that they'll never separate. And that power I'm describing is the depth of the basin. So then it seems like risk dominance would say, is it the case that in over 50% of the space, they won't be attracting each other? But it would miss the point that once they make it together, they are phenomenally sticky. 
like the strength of attraction. The strength of attraction. Yeah. yeah. So, so, that so would the, be analogous, that would be analogous yeah. to the relative payoffs when you make it to S one. Right. And so the problem is that. Uh, with the problem with that analogy is that here, because this is really only a one-dimensional thing, the strength doesn't matter. It's only the direction. Because here, strength would translate into how quickly you move in the direction. <coughs> so the, 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 the so a novel mutation arises when you're equilibrium with S1 or S2. <coughs> so then the probability of that mutation making it to the boundary is going to be dictated by the uh, this temperature governed selective process, which ah, is so okay. To now you're into the world of stochastic things, and so everything that I'm talking about so far is a deterministic world where uh, the population always moves in the direction of the of the arrow. And as you weaken the force of selection, basically what Fiery is is alluding to is here. I'm saying, well, okay, if the population is you know here such that S two is doing better than S one. Like you have infinitely strong selection, and therefore variability in selection in, in the in the relative payoffs is just doesn't matter. Push to ceiling or whatever. Right. Well, right. Well, exactly. Although there isn't there is an interesting thing there, which is maybe not exactly what you're thinking about, but related, which is that there are there was an, there was another. Correct me if I'm wrong about this. Maybe there, there, there was another equilibrium selection concept called Pareto, like basically. If the if one of the strict equilibria uh, everyone does better on than the other one, like this is true in the stack hunt game, right? Like yeah. if everyone does better through the stack, uh, and so you would think that even though they're both stable, you would people would go there. It turns out they didn't gain slice stack hunt. Uh, I think this is one of the exercises Adam was going to do this afternoon. Oh, I take it. Is back. exactly this uh, okay. yeah. to illustrate this fascinating point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but yeah, totally. So let's 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 leave this uh, as suspense. Are you going to do that, Adam? Yeah. Okay. Cool. If I understand. Yeah, I think you just pointed that it's like efficiency versus risk yeah, tolerance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So when selection is infinitely strong, the only thing that matters is the direction of it. Um, and when selection is pretty strong, that is still true. But you can get cool things happening when selection gets sufficiently weak. Uh, that then weird, interesting things, I think, along the lines of what you're talking about matter. But so risk dominance is a strong selection concept, basically. Okay, so, so you, this is, uh, we've now seen two types of outcomes, possible outcomes. We've got dominance and we've got bi-stability. But now there's also a third possible outcome, which is uh, that when you're at, when everyone's doing strategy two, strategy one does better. So strategy two is not stable. And when everyone's doing strategy one, strategy two does better. So strategy one is not a stable equilibrium either. And again, because there's this change in sign of who's doing better than who, uh, by continuity, there must be some uh, interior point where they have equal payoff. And now the interior equilibrium is the one that's stable because if you perturb off a little bit in either direction, you go back. Uh, and so this corresponds to the case where neither strategy is a pure equilibrium. Uh, and this is like the uh, anti-coordination games that you guys were asking about before. And so here what you see is you don't get, uh, you know, if, if you were imagining that strategy one is cooperation and strategy two is defection for the East, say, or in the snowdrift game, you don't get a situation where everyone learns to defect like the prisoner's dilemma. You also don't get a situation where everyone learns to cooperate. But instead, you get some interior mixed equilibrium, which in the dynamical, uh, and I forget about that for a second, which in the dynamical uh, sense is called coexistence. So you get stable coexistence of both types. Um, and you can say the, the, the amount of, uh, there is of one type versus the other type, you can figure out by calculating what's the frequency of, you know, what's the value of P that leads to the payoff of the two strategies uh, being equal. And that is gonna be the point of your stable interior equilibrium. And uh, I didn't talk about this, but, uh, and I'm not gonna talk about it other than this one box, but there also is a Nash equilibrium equivalent to this, which is, in, we've only ever talked about it so far as saying your strategy is either to play strategy one or strategy two, <coughs> but you could have a mixed equilibrium 
which is to say, or mixed strategy, which is to say I play strategy one with some probability and strategy two with you know, one minus that probability. And so uh, this corresponds to the Nash equilibrium in which everybody plays strategy one with one probability and strategy two with the other probability such that the expected payoffs of the two strategies are the same. Is chicken one of these? Yes. So chicken, a uh, snowdrift is the same thing as chicken and as, uh, what's the other one? There's three canonical names for it. Uh, oh, hawk dove. So, you know, know, you can be aggressive or you can be passive. Like, if both people are aggressive, that's bad. If both people are passive, eh, that's fine. But, like, if the other guy's going to be passive, you want to be aggressive. If the other one's going to be aggressive, you want to be passive. And so you get coexistence. Um, and that's one of these things. So one of the explanations for the evolution of personality, which is, uh, that, or sorry, of, of individual differences in personality. That's one of the explanations for the existence of personality psychology <laughs> as a field uh, is uh, this. <laughs> uh, you know, which is to say that like, there is, uh, you know, Right, so it's, it's good to play different, to have different strategies from other people in the personality domain and so you can get coexistence. Um, okay, so just to recap, uh, there are these three, when you have only two strategies, there's only three possible things that can happen. Dominance, uh, uh, which is what happens in social dilemmas for cooperation, or also mutualisms in cooperation, which is like both people are just strictly better by cooperating and their cooperation dominates defection. You can have bi-stability from uh, co uh, coordination games, and you can have coexistence from anti-coordination games. Um, okay, so that's my next break point, which is uh, at this point we've just done the conceptual principles of uh, you know, evolutionary dynamics. And now what I'm going to do in the next chunk is uh, talk about specifically how you would implement this. Um, so m more questions at this point? No, it's uh, a repeated prisoner's dilemma is bistable because the payoff structure it's it's a different game. And so if you if you calculate what are the and actually I'm gonna do that in I don't know, maybe twenty minutes or something like that. So we'll come back to that. In, in, in questioning whether a repeated prisoner dilemma is bistable, I have this instinct to say that it depends on the strategy space that you're in. Yep. And so my question is, A, is that true, and B, is that general? Is, it, is the stability of a game, can it be stated just with respect to the game? Or must it always be conditioned on the strategy space that you've defined? So basically the latter. Um, but there is a way to say for a given strategy. So if you have a game and you want to say, is a particular strategy in this game in equilibrium? I guess that doesn't even, that doesn't really address stability. But I guess, yeah, if it's strict Nash, then it has to be stable. So yeah, you can do a calculation as a way to say, uh, this is an equilibrium because it cannot be beaten by any possible strategy that one could ever conceive of in this game. Um, but, and that's the thing that economists like to do. Yeah. But the standard thing in evolutionary game theory is not to do that but instead just say, well, I've got a set of strategies, and what are the stable equilibria given this set of strategies? Why is there a reason the evolutionary game theory is simpler? <laughs> uh, and you know, I think that evolutionary game theory basically came out of the prisoner's dilemma, which is, which is real simple. Um, in order to do the other thing, also, you need to express your strategies as finite state automata, and say, uh, you know, do you have just like a one-time deviation like what are the consequences of that and whatever. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I think the, the, the short answer is it's more complicated. Um, and and I should say I'm much more of an evolutionary game theorist than uh, an, econ an economist game theorist. So I don't mean to be trash talking evolutionary game theory by always saying that we do the simple dumb things. Um, but maybe I did that. Oops. Okay. Other questions? If not, I think. It oh, this is a good time for the for a half hour break, and we'll come back. Great.
so uh, I remember during the break that I was supposed to have introduced myself at the beginning, and I failed to do so. Uh, so I will take this opportunity. Um, so I'm Dave Rand. Uh, I am currently a professor at Yale, uh, and um, I have like a weird trajectory where I started as a computational biologist, um, doing like totally non-social stuff. Like my senior thesis in undergrad was like a differential equation model of electrical energy transport and photosynthesis. Uh, and then in grad school, I went to grad school here and worked with Martin Novak. Uh, I got into evolutionary game theory and then also started to hang out with Josh Green and sort of got exposed to all of that stuff. And I was like, hey, this is cool. Um, and then I kind of evolved into a social scientist. And when I went on the job market, I applied to psych and econ and business schools. I said, yeah, let's see what happens. Uh, and it turned out I was a psychologist. Uh, <laughs> uh, and now I've spent, I guess, four years as a psych professor. Um, and so I've sort of gotten a good chunk of that as my identity. But, uh, and this is uh, relevant, I guess, in, perhaps in particular for people here, uh, next year I'm moving to MIT. Um, and what's a Sloan? Well, I guess a joint between Sloan and brain and cognitive science. But what that means is that I will be in Boston and uh, doing all of these kinds of things and looking for, and I'm coming basically with most of my grad students having just graduated. And so to the extent that people here are interested in this kind of stuff and want to potentially do things uh, together, you know, let me know. Okay, so uh, where we got so far was what are game, what is game theory and what are some games? What's the Nash equilibrium? What are dynamics? Uh, you know, sort of the general, in general, how do evolutionary dynamics work? And the sort of basic take home, at least from the examples that we looked at, are that this sort of static concepts of Nash equilibrium and risk dominance, which you just get from looking at the payoff matrix and not having to do any kind of simulating anything or whatever, looking at how things change over time, actually give you a lot of insight into what the long run outcomes of the dynamics are going to be. Things are going to typically converge to Nash equilibria. Risk dominance is a simple calculation that will give you some insight into which equilibrium it's probably going to uh, converge to. And so that's great. But uh, just doing these uh, equilibrium calculations doesn't let you see the actual dynamics, like the actual paths that are taken to get there. And uh, more importantly, when you have more than two strategies, uh, you can have uh, emergent phenomena where you get uh, much more complicated things happening that the Nash equilibrium doesn't give you insight into. And so uh, that's why it's useful uh, to actually look at dynamics. And so one way of doing it, this sort of classical evolutionary game theory tool, is deterministic. That is to say, there's no randomness. It's always that strategies with higher payoffs are becoming more common. Strategies with lower payoffs are becoming less common. And uh, the, the canonical way of modeling this is the replicator equation. So it's a differential equation of the flavor that the change in x uh, is the, current, the amount of x that there is right now times how the payoff of x uh, relates to the average payoff in the population. So if the average population is just the sum over all strategies of the frequency of that strategy times its payoff. And so basically what this boils down to is saying that like, uh, so if your strategy, if, you, if this is strategy, if X's strategy's payoff is better than average, this is gonna be positive and the frequency of X is gonna increase and how quickly it increases depends on how much better it's doing and how many of them there are in the first place to be reproducing. If X is doing less, uh, is doing worse than average, X is gonna get less common. And uh, you know, if we do it for two strategies, uh, if we've got, these are our payoffs for the two strategies that we saw before, uh, then because there's only two strategies, there's only one, you only need one variable because it's the frequency of the one versus the other, and so you get just this one differential equation for the change in, uh, if P is the fraction of strategies playing, uh, it's a fraction of agents playing strategy one, you can just get this differential equation for change in P, uh, where you just have its strategy, and then you've got you know, the, the, the payoff, the fraction of agents playing strategy one times their payoff, fraction of agents playing strategy two times strategy two's payoff, 
and great. And you can rearrange this to be, it's like, not that I think this is going to mean anything to anyone, but it's like a logistic growth where the direction and speed is just the difference in the payoffs. So uh, whatever you can do this uh, and you can use uh, these differential equations, you can numerically integrate them to make cute pictures like this, say for rock, paper, scissors. Uh, you can trace trajectories. So say you start here, you'll go around in a trajectory like this forever. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, it's now like a three-dimensional, sorry. So as we said uh, before, if you have only two strategies, you can represent the entire population, any pop possible makeup of the population with a line. If you have three strategies, you can represent any possible makeup of the population with a triangle. So in this corner, it's all scissors. In this corner, it's all rock. In this corner, it's all paper. In the middle, it's one third, one third, one third. Here in the middle of this edge, there's no rock, and it's half paper, half scissors. And this is called a simplex for whatever reason. And so you can trace these uh, evolutionary patterns in the simplex by numerically integrating the differential equations. Um, and uh, in addition to doing that, the thing that's great about it is often you can just analytically solve the differential equations, um, that is, without having to plug in specific numbers and look at specific trajectories. You can just say, you know, fully generally, what are the solutions to uh, this dynamical system? What are the possible stable states? And how do they depend on the parameters? And so you can have a full characterization of everything that's going on, which is cool. Um, and uh, also, in terms of doing numerical integration, it's not a deterministic thing. Sorry, it's not a probabilistic thing. You know for sure if you start in one place, the same thing is always going to happen. So that is great. And also, it's fast because it's just numerically integrating differential equations. So you don't have to run 10 million generations of an agent based simulation, which takes a day on a supercomputer or whatever. Uh, so that's awesome. But uh, you have to have a discrete set of strategies and uh, if you have more than a few of them, it gets real hard to do anything analytically or even sort of visualize the results of your simulations. Um, you, uh, and so basically if you want m larger numbers of strategies or more complicated payoff functions, it gets hard to do it with replicator dynamics. And uh, you notice the fact that it does not include randomness is listed as both an advantage and a disadvantage. Uh, and it is an advantage from a simplicity perspective, but it's a disadvantage from the perspective of a lot of the time randomness is important and can change the outcomes. So I'm basically not going to say anything more about replicator equation. And instead, what I'm going to talk about are agent-based models, um, which are the things that uh, basically I started the first slide of the whole talk being like, this one slide is the whole thing. It's, uh, it's this. And so the idea of agent-based modeling is, and I don't know if you, some of the stuff you guys did in previous days would fall under this rubric. I guess in some sense they're we, like no agent-based models. But yes, right. Well, it's, it's just a different we, kind of update. model multiple agents interacting with each other. Right. And just updating their strategies through and, some and other process. Yeah, exactly. Right. So in general, you have a population of agents there's some set of traits and a set of possible values for each trait, and an agent is defined by that agent's specific value for each of the possible traits. Um, and then you have a time period, we'll call them generations, but they're just time periods, uh, where the agents do something. What they do is determined by their, uh, the values they have for each trait, and then uh, some update rule happens where the, the, the value of the traits change as a result of what happens. And uh, then uh, we want to know what happens to the values of the traits over time. And so the stuff that you guys did before, I think, falls within this definition where you had one particular uh, set of rules about how traits update over time, which was reinforcement learning or whatever. Um, but uh, you know, we're going to talk about a different set of update rules, but the, the beauty of agent-based simulating in general is that it's totally general. You can specify anything you want uh, in a simple way of like, well, this is how the agents interact, and this is how they, uh, this is how the strategies update, and 
that like unlike things like replicator equation or sort of mathematical modeling in general where you typically are constrained by what you're able to solve, for here you just put in whatever you want and then you just push the button and it runs and you get to see what population level phenomena emerge from the set of rules that you specify. And so this is like emergence, which was like a cool buzzword 20 years ago maybe. Uh, and well, like complex systems and stuff like that. And so the idea is uh, you put in a relatively simple set of rules that you can specify however you want, and then you look at what population level phenomena uh, occur. And this is just is a good opportunity for a small tangent about the value uh, or my sort of general philosophy on, on formal modeling uh, is that uh, it's with agent-based models in particular, it's trivial to take whatever you want, put it in an agent-based model, and push run and see what happens. And you could have papers of the form, I put this in and this came out, cool. Uh, but like, that doesn't get you very far uh, most of the time. Like the thing that you, the reason you're making the model is you want to understand why what's happening is happening, and so like the challenge is often not the constructing of the model and then running it and seeing what happens, but the challenge is figuring out why, uh, and like like you know you see some you know as you vary parameters you see different things happening and you want to explain it, and there is the temptation to make up a story that based on your intuitions and lay theories about the world and stuff like that makes sense. Like, oh, these agents are thinking about this or this, whatever. Like, and you can make up a story that like, you know, makes sense, but that doesn't, that's not right. That is the thing that you need, is you need a story that's actually supported by things that you can get out of the simulation. And so it's kind of like a mini version of the whole scientific method where you come up with some theory about why your model is doing the thing that it's doing. And then you have to vary the parameters in some way that would like do something that that explanation would predict to sort of support it. Um, or like look mechanistically at what's going on and try and figure it out. So that's like, and I, th I think of this as like the Martin Novak uh, approach and one of the many things that Novak is so amazingly good at is coming up with intuitions to explain why what's happening in the model is happening that are actually correct intuitions rather than just like cute sounding intuitions. And so if that's the challenging, that's, if that's a lot of the challenge of modeling, what I think of is the curse of the good modeler is that uh, if you manage to succeed in coming up with a really good intuitive explanation for why the model is working uh, the way it is, and then you explain it to uh, someone, like everything make complete sense because you came up with a good explanation and then people will say oh that's obvious <laughs> that is in some sense the challenge is come up with an explanation that makes it seem obvious ex post um, and then ex post nobody wants to publish your paper because they say it's obvious uh, and so uh, but the point is it wouldn't have been obvious if you hadn't done the the like really hard work of coming up with the intuition so uh, you know that's a thing that happens um, but the, I think that the, the point is that for me, it's really critically important when you're making these models to really understand why they're doing what they're doing. Um, otherwise, I feel like you haven't really learned anything. Okay, so the basic skeleton of the agent-based models uh, are you've got some population of N agents and, and M different traits, and so you have a, uh, the state of your population is represented by uh, a vector, sorry, a matrix, an n by m matrix that just has you know all of the traits for all of the agents, um, and uh, like everything is of the form. Uh, okay, initialize some values in the population, and then for each iteration, you know, get payoffs for each agent uh, based on their strategies and the strategies of everyone else. Uh, either update it or not based on those payoffs, store the current state of the population in some history uh, you know, uh, matrix, and then repeat that you know, lots and lots of times 
and then look at the contents of the history to see what happened. Um, and that's kind of like AWS modeling in general. For the evolution, it's uh, basically everything is the same, except that the payoff uh, is, uh, you know, is determined by its traits and the, agent, the other agent's traits, they're interacting with each other. And then you have to specify how it is you update the population. And so that's the, in the agent-based models, there's two different places where the magic happens, really. One is how you specify the interactions between the agents that generate payoffs or whatever. And the other is in the update rule that specifies how the, the traits of the agents change as a result of those payoffs. <clears throat> and so the Moran process is the most commonly used update rule in evolutionary game theory. Uh, and um, the way it works is every generation, you randomly pick one agent to die. And then you pick one agent proportional to fitness, in this case, proportional to payoff in the game, to reproduce, which means that you change the strategy of the agent that died to be the strategy of the agent that reproduced. Um, and in the Moran process, the probability of being picked is just the agent's fitness divided by the total population fitness is the probability that it gets picked. And this is very similar to the softmax function that you guys talked about before, except in the softmax function, uh, it's, the exp it's e to the agent's fitness divided by the sum of e to each of the agent's fitnesses. And in the Moran process, that's in the standard Moran process, that's not true. In the Moran process with exponential fitness, that is true. And although the Moran process is the standard thing that's used, I basically always use Moran process with exponential fitness, um, the, or exponential payoffs, whatever. Uh, and not because it's the formulation of softmax. I actually didn't really ever think about that until Adam pointed it out to me two days ago while we were prepping for this. Um, but the reason that exponentiating the fitnesses is in general useful is that uh, it allows negative payoffs. Because if it's basically, I think, the reason that people use it for value. Great. All right. Well, then everybody's on the same page. Um, and that, yeah, right. OK. And, right, right. So and, and the way that in, norm, in sort of standard evolutionary game theory, the way that they deal with that is by just adding a constant to all payoffs, where that constant is the most negative possible payoff. And so that guarantees that all agents have positive payoffs but that also reduces the intensity of selection because it's sort of reducing variance in payoffs by just adding a constant to everyone. Um, because a multiplicative constant would cancel out, but an additive constant doesn't. If you think about it, so if you're saying your payoff divided by the total payoff is your probability of getting picked, if the payoff that you earn in the game ranges from zero to 10, and then you add a million to every payoff, that difference from the game no longer matters, and basically all agents are equally likely to get picked. So, is, sorry, is that how they control selection intensity also? Yes, okay. but, but the problem is that then there's a cap on the maximum selection of int intensity of selection you can get, which is dumb, so I use the exponential. Um, I think you're missing something. Why, don't, why do you pick the person who's going to die randomly and not somebody who has low fitness? Uh, in You could also do that, but then you have selection entering. So either you can imagine that selection governs your probability of, like, that is, there's two separate things. There's ability, like, there's success at staying alive, and there's reproductive success. And so in this model, the, the, you're assuming that payoff is related to the number of offspring that you produce. And so therefore, the critical thing is when an offspring is being produced, whose offspring is it? But you could also have something where payoff affects your probability of surviving. Um, and you could think about it in, in the social learning case. You can have it here. People decide to update their strategies at random. Uh, that is, you sort of flip a coin every day to be like, should I, get a, new, should I get, get a new strategy or not? And then you look around and copy the people that are doing well. But you could also imagine the worse you're doing, the more likely you are to say, hey, I better update my strategy, which seems uh, plausible. That seems perfectly reasonable. Um, this is the standard way of doing it in evolutionary game theory. I'm about 95% sure that uh, it wouldn't make any difference. Um, yeah. Um, but. Maybe yeah. it increases selection strength. 
Yeah, so. exactly. That, that would be my guess is that it's basically just inc increases the amount that payoff matters because now it matters in the same way for both things. Um, but so, you know, this is like the, the wild west of, of, of agent-based modeling. That is, there's an infinite number of ways of implementing these things. And so, like, there are conventions that got established that are, like, the typical way of doing it. But, like, you know, it would be easy, you know, for example, actually, that's what something in this afternoon section, whatever uh, it's called, that's something you could play around with. And just, like, look, does it change anything? to change death from being random to being inversely proportional to the payoff. Maybe I'm missing something, but it seems like if you're just replacing the dead agent with a copy of the dead agent, then you're not really changing the population at all. For that. You're, so you're replacing it with a copy of the agent who's proportional to it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So it's off Did I have a typo up here? Okay. No, I, I think it was just the agent. replace the dead agent with a copy of itself. Oh, so sorry, I meant of, of this guy. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got it. Sorry. Um, and so that's selection, but also mutation happens. And so with some probability u, uh, instead of replacing the dead agent with the agent who was picked proportional to fitness, you replace the dead agent with a randomly selected agent. Um, and uh, I guess we'll come back to this later. Uh, so, I mean, if you have the two, if, if you've got two different types uh, and they both have the same fitness, then uh, the probability that one, anyone is picked to die is 1 over n. The probability that anyone is picked to reproduce, again, is just fitness over total population fitness. The total population fitness is 10 because there's 10 agents. Uh, then you can uh, say, how is this? Oh yeah. So right, because there's uh, the if the total population fitness is ten, and the payoff of the blue ones is one, and the payoff of the red ones is one, that means the probability that any individual uh, blue agent is picked to reproduce is one tenth, and the probability that any given red agent is picked to reproduce is one tenth, and so then the thing that you want to know is what's the probability that the agent that's picked to reproduce is blue, it's just going to be 4 out of 10 because there's 4 of them, and the probability that a red agent is picked is going to be 6 out of 10 because there's 6 of them. And so this means that they're neutral because they have the same payoff, and so in the case that the payoffs are neutral, which one is more likely to get to pick to reproduce? It just depends on frequency. And so you've got a neutral process, uh, yeah. But where it's more interesting is when they're not neutral. And so now, if you know, the payoff of the blue guy is 3, then still the probability that any given agent is picked to die is 1 over n, and whatever, that's the same. And now the total population fitness is 18, uh, and the probability that a given blue agent is picked to produce is 3 out of 18, because their payoff is 3, and the red agent is 1 out of 18. Uh, and so that means the probability that an agent that's picked to reproduce is blue is now, there's four, so you're picking an agent, there's four chances that the guy that you pick is blue, and for each of those, there's a three out of 18 chance that that guy gets picked, and so you get 12 out of 18, uh, you know, 12 18th likelihood that it's blue, whereas it's only six uh, out of 18 that it's red, and so here, even though red is more common, uh, sorry, even though, yeah, even though red is more common, blue is more likely to get picked to reproduce because it has a higher payoff. And that's you know natural selection. Uh, so the more general uh, version of this is that um, well, whatever. I'm going to skip this because it's kind of boring. Um, so uh, this is the slide that I showed at the beginning. That just basically all of evolutionary game theory is you have a population. You go through a number of generations. Every generation, they play with each other and get payoffs. Pick someone to die. Pick someone partial fitness to reproduce. Maybe have a mutation happen. Store that. And run it for 10 million generations and see what happens. And that's uh, all there is to it. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the stuff that I was going to say about evolution of game theory. And now I've got like some fun, specific applications to talk about, but not an amazing amount of time, I realize. What, when is this, when it, are we supposed to go to 12 or 12.30? 12, but, you know, 
All right, well, let's go to 12, and then we can take a vote if I should keep talking about things or get food. Uh, OK, so may before I, ask, I guess before, uh, ask, yeah, I was going to say, before that, questions. OK, I've got a couple questions. Great. Just about um, general strategies for setting up games. Yes. So um, I can imagine uh, like just thinking about how strategies impact um, you know, decisions in the real world or something like that. I can imagine that I would have a strategy that um, gives me a, a little value in the current generation, but maybe like three generations like henceforth, um, like uh, it, is, is a good choice. So can you set up games where there's the long-term dependencies like that? So the way that it's usually done is that you think of there's sort of two separate time scales. There's the time scale of interaction and there's the time scale of evolution, which is to say that within one generation, you can, here we've only been modeling just like a single shot game, but you can have repeated games, you can have ongoing things within a generation where like you make a choice that's costly for you today, but gives you some benefit tomorrow. And so all of that stuff happens within a generation, such that when the generation comes to a close, everyone has reaped both the short and long-term benefits that they're gonna get. You pick someone to reproduce, you reset all the payoffs to zero, and you do the same thing again. But you could potentially have a system where you have, and that makes a lot of sense, I think, for uh, genetic evolution in certain kinds of, like, well, whatever, I won't even say that, fine. That's just, that's a simplifying assumption. Um, but you could have a thing where payoffs uh, persist across generations, um, such that you don't have that strict separation between uh, time scales. The thing that makes it a little bit tricky is that when an agent uh, dies and is replaced with a new agent, what do you do? Do you put that agent in with zero uh, payoff? Which means even if he's got a good strategy, he's necessarily going to be at a disadvantage compared to the agents from the previous generations whose payoffs have been accumulating over generations. Does he keep the previous agent's payoff? Does he get his parents' payoff? Like whatever. And it's just something you have to specify. So you can do that but it's not standard. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely, that's interesting. And then my, my second thing is that, um, so uh, I can imagine payoffs that are like multi-dimensional, right? So like if I choose to cheat on the test, like, well, I get a, I better, I get a better grade on that test, but you know, like maybe I become known as someone who's not trustworthy in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, they also have uh, games where there's sort of like, well, you, you get benefit on this, and uh, you get a cost on this, and maybe there's some sort of thinking people's preferences for, for those things or, or how, how those interact. So like in uh, reinforcement learning, uh, in order for evolution to work, there, you have to collapse everything down into a common currency, which is the currency, in this case, upon which selection operates. Um, and so, uh, so you basically have to say like, well, cheating on the test has this much expected value, um, taking into account both the fact that I'm untrustworthy and the fact that I'm going to get a better grade. Right. And so in, in these models, uh, there's no preferences in that there's just this one, which is basically selection is working to optimize utility or basically as defined by fitness. And you can define that however you want. You could have a version of this where you have different types of agents and those agents have different preferences, and, those, and therefore the same outcome is valued differently by different agents. And then you can have evolution happening within those different types based essentially on different, uh, different definitions of fitness, and they will evolve in different directions. Um, but, so that's a thing that you can do, but that is not what is usually done. But it could be cool. Mm -hmm. I was gonna ask you what you thought about. There seems like there's this really deep interplay between the stuff that you covered, the stuff that Sam covered, and the stuff that Larry covered. Which is that if you think about how agents work in the natural world, um, you're plot down in this environment. You don't know what the rules are. You don't know what the payoffs are, and you don't know what games are available. So it seems like what you have to learn is all of these things. You have to learn uh, what what the values are of the actions that you choose to take, and you have to learn kind of the, from the space of games that are available, which ones are the ones that are relevant in your culture or something like that. Mm -hmm. So is there any kind of effort to um, maybe combine these three approaches to, to, to 
to afford kind of multiple levels of learning? Yeah, so, so the first thing that I would say is that the, the evolutionary game theory approach to that question mm-hmm. is essentially to assume that nobody is actually learning anything about the games that they're playing, that is nobody has any model, that is in a, in a model-based, model-free sort of way. None of the agents in any of these evolutionary game theory things have any model of anything. Uh, they don't have any in general sense of what the possible strategies are, except in so much that when a mutation happens, it's picked from you know, the set of possible strategies, and it's just about copying, saying you don't need to know the game that you're playing, you don't need to know the like what would be best, you don't need to do any complica- complicated calculation, you just have to say who's doing well, okay I'll do what that person does. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's the sort of solution to this, you're plopped down in the world and you don't know anything about what's going on problem that's basically taken by these models is don't worry about it, just see what other people are doing. But in terms of your, your more general question about putting these things together, the only person that I know of who has done that is Fiery in this work that I think is super cool um, and that I keep telling everybody about, uh, of um, basically having evolutionary, in, in the this, in this separation of time scales that I was mentioning before, basically uh, Fiery has stuff where uh, reinforcement learning is happening within generation and then evolution is happening across generations where you're, and now I'm mixing the terminologies across the different days, I think, because I, you know, it's not really my specialty. But I think, as I recall, the idea is what you inherit is essentially a prior. So like, like evolution is operating on the priors that you start with when you are born, and then learning happens during the generations based on those priors. So there's a, I will, I will post in the shared folder a paper from now almost 10 years ago in which we looked at the evolution of priors to try to explain the evolution of punishment. And that's one way of integrating the Bayesian stuff and the RL stuff is to say, look, what you're going to get out of natural selection are maybe some initial good beliefs in the language of cognitive development, inductive constraints, right? And um, that was my first attempt to, to ever do anything about the evolutionary dynamics of cognition. I got really frustrated trying to model punishment in a Bayesian framework because to, to, to extract the intuition, the intuition was you're born believing that other people are going to punish you or, or born believing that other people are going to be nice or something like that. But that didn't seem like the right character. But like, if you look at the way that economists talk, they talk about people being born with preferences, like they have an innate preference for retribution. Um, so many years later, Adam took over a project in which instead of allowing priors to evolve and then just doing rational behavior and giving your Bayesian model of the world, we allowed reward functions to evolve. So the idea is when you program a reinforcement learning algorithm, it starts out innately with some specification of reward. Should that just be identical to the goodness that it proves? Is there ever a rationale for having part of your reward function not just be identical to the fitness consequences of your behavior, narrowly construed? So anyway, there's already a preprint on the Google Drive, which is Adam's paper, that um, looks at what happens when you allow reward functions to evolve in that same case of retributive punishment. So it might be interesting to look back and forth between those two papers, because the, the target behavior that we're interested in retributive punishment remains the same. But the modeling approach switches between Bayesian, uh, Bayesian and RL. I will also, you know, we're not the only people who have done things roughly in this domain. There is a fun paper that looks at not multi-agent, but just static individual. Not stat, okay, static is the wrong word. Um, what Dave called nature, just like one person out in nature, one reinforcement learning out in nature, reinforcement learning agent out in nature. It, Hiking, would, kayaking. Would, would you get the evolution of a reward function potentially that isn't just the fitness function there? Um, so the, you, the, that's the same paper. And could you drop that? Because I, I don't know exactly what to look up. Uh, but that, that's another. Uh, but 
But anyway, that's certainly, I think, a very fruitful space for people who want to try to do a lot in the next three days, but you'd be biting off a lot, is to embed a Bayesian or RL agent within an evolutionary framework. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's like a really exciting uh, and promising area um, for it, basically integrating across these things that traditionally have been totally separate but have this very nice way to, to hook up. Stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna try and do uh, a like selection of different things, and we'll see how well this goes. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is repeated games because that's already come up, and it's like the most core thing in all of evolution of cooperation. Um, so in the prisoner's dilemma, defection dominates cooperation. The question is, what if each pair of agents, instead of just playing a one-shot prisoner's dilemma, they play multiple times with each other each generation? And so what that means is that now, instead of a strategy just being cooperate or defect, now you have a strategy that specifies how you condition your choice on what's happened before. And in particular, tit for tat is everybody's favorite uh, strategy for this. And so tit for tat says you start with cooperate in the first round, and then in all subsequent rounds, you just do whatever your partner did in the previous round. Uh, and so what this means is that when, so if this is our just whatever payoff, prisoners on the payoff matrix, uh, if two tit-for-tat players, uh, when they play with each other, they just cooperate the whole time because they both start out by cooperating and then copy each other's cooperation. Uh, and when a tit-for-tat player gets matched with a player that just always defects, uh, they get exploited in the first round, but then switch to defection in all subsequent rounds. And so uh, what that means, and then if two all always defect players meet, they just get zero. And so that means that this payoff matrix gets transformed into this payoff matrix. Uh, which uh, you may notice is a coordination game because now if you know the other guy is going to play tit for tat uh, you should also play tit for tat rather than exploiting in the first round because then you miss out even though you do better in the first round than you do over here you miss out on all this subsequent benefit of mutual cooperation and so uh, the ability to condition your future play on, uh, you know, or the ability to condition your play on future actions can transform social dilemmas into coordination games and make it so that instead of having, uh, I said the wrong thing, this should be by stability, not coexistence. Sorry. Uh, just for the future. Um, uh, it, uh, so this, uh, Dominance is transformed into by stability. Uh, and more generally, if you have some probability W of the next round occurring, that means that uh, in probability 1 minus W, the game ends. And so then there's no more conditioning possible. You're matched with a new partner that doesn't know what you did before. Uh, that means that on average, any two agents play 1 over 1 minus W rounds together. That's just a property of the world. That is, it is the case that probability W of uh, round continuing produces that number of average rounds. That means that the expected payoffs of tit for tat and all d against each other are the tit for tat players get b minus c in each of the one minus uh, one over one minus w rounds uh, when they play with each other. But when tit for tat and all d meet, it just the expo exploitation only happens in the first round. And so if you can see from this that always defect is always a Nash because if you know the other guy is going to defect, you should just defect also. But uh, if b minus c over 1 minus w is greater than b, which trans simplifies to w is greater than c over b, then tit for tat is also a Nash. And so uh, what that means is that, um, uh, well, yeah, that basically if the likelihood of future interaction is sufficiently high, or if the average game length is sufficiently long, then it becomes an equilibrium to cooperate but it also is still always in equilibrium to defect. And so that's a general principle for mechanisms for the evolution of cooperation, is in general, there are things that make cooperation stable, but it's extremely hard to destabilize defection. And so typically you're in a situation where you have multiple equilibria, and then the question is, what gets you to the good sort of cooperative equilibrium? Um, and, oh yeah, this is this thing about the two different time scales that we were just mentioning before, and now you have the within generation time scale where people are playing prisoners' dilemmas with each other and conditioning play on people's past behaviors. 
and getting payoffs. And then you have the across generation uh, time scale where the frequency of those strategies uh, are changing. Um, and yeah, whatever. So um, this is given that there's not that much time, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, oh, I should. I guess you could say that you know if you if you have this payoff matrix now, um, and you know you can uh, if if W is greater than C over B, you have phi stability between them, as we were just saying, because both of them are equilibria. But you can also do the risk dominance calculation and say what is required for tit for tat to risk dominate all D, and it you know that's. It, it happens if the payoff of tit for tat in the 50-50 population is greater than the payoff of all D in the 50-50 population, which simplifies to this condition. And it so happens that uh, if you look at experimental data where you bring people into the lab and have them play repeated prisoner's dilemmas for an hour with each other, it's where they learn what strategies to play. Um, uh, the you can say, how well does this risk dominance condition predict what actually happens? And so risk dominance is just a binary condition. One strategy is risk dominant over the other, and it's just one way or the other. But to fire the point that Fiery raised earlier, really you can think of this as a continuous thing where the greater W is relative to this, the more risk dominant tit for tat is. And in the language we were using before, that means the bigger the basin of attraction for tit for tat is relative to all D. And so we did this little uh, mini meta-analysis in this 2013 Tix paper where we took a bunch of different experimental conditions from some four different papers. And uh, on the x-axis, you have basically that W, you have W minus 2C over B plus C. So the bigger this is, the more risk dominant tit for tat is relative to all D. And then you have the fraction of people choosing cooperative strategies, and it uh, remarkably well it explains the data remarkably well. And Dalbo and Frechette have done a follow up now with a whole lot more experiments that also shows that this condition is a very good organizer of the data. Um, so that's cool. Uh, and then um, everything is going great. But you could also imagine a strategy that always cooperates. Uh, and so even though it has the ability to condition, it doesn't. Um, and so when all C plays with all D, it just gets exploited every time. And so if you fill in the rest of the payoff matrix, all C against itself, they just cooperate every time and they get the six. And when all C meets tit for tat, they also all just cooperate with each other. So everybody's having this great outcome. But all D is able to exploit all C when they meet. And so now, if you want to think about the dynamics, uh, we have this issue that all C and all and tit for tat are neutral with each other. That is, it doesn't matter, you know, which is which. And so that means that tit for tat is not a strict Nash equilibrium anymore because you can deviate without decreasing your payoff. Um, and so one point is to which fiery's thing whether something is a Nash or not in this thing depends on what you're comparing it to. So if it's just tit for tat and all D, you'd say tit for tat is a strict Nash. But once you include all C, it's not a strict Nash anymore. And so uh, along the edge where it's only tit for tat and all D, you can have this bi stability that we were talking about before. But once you include all C, <clears throat> what happens is all C is dominated by all D. And you have, neutr and you have neutrality uh, between all tit for tat and all C. And so what that means is that <clears throat> uh, if you uh, start, whatever, okay, so you can do this uh, replicator type thing, what you will find out is that there is some uh, edge here where the basin of attraction, anything in here, there's enough all C around that all D will take over, but anywhere in here, there is enough tit for tat that tit for tat is, uh, you know, that all D loses out. Um, and so basically, when you wind up starting somewhere in here, you wind up in an outcome that is all cooperation of one flavor or another. If you start up in here, you wind up at always defect. Uh, and so this could be like, well, okay, fair. So it's still the same thing as before, where there's essentially bi stability between cooperative strategies and non cooperative strategies. But the problem is imagine that you know you start somewhere in here and then you wind up with this 
uh, coexistence of tit for tat and all C. Um, if you didn't include randomness, things would just be done and that would be great. But once you have neutrality, you can have neutral drift, which is just by random chance, because these two strategies are all getting the same payoff, you can sort of drift back and forth along this edge. And so, can I just yeah. pause for one second? And this may be clear to everyone already, but it's not an accident that one of these arrows is straight and the other is looped. And I just want to make it explicit that what's what's being indicated there is that within the region ah, yeah, 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 yeah. of okay. that upper left triangle, selection is going to push people towards the bottom edge. Well, so what, right? so what happens if you think about what's happened is so say you start here where you've got uh, a lot of all C. Say you start here, so it's 50-50 all C and tit for tat, and just like an epsilon amount of all D. Because there's a lot of all C, all D is actually going to do well. And so it's going to start moving in this direction, that is the frequency of all D is increasing, uh, and the frequency of all C is decreasing. Uh, but eventually you're going to get to a point where now there's, there's sufficiently little all C around that there are essentially no all C players for all D to prey on. And so now tit for tat is going to start beating all D, and all D is going to start dying out. But then as all D starts dying out, suddenly it's not so bad to be all C anymore. And so it starts bending back around a little bit. So and then I guess this my question edge. is, though, if we drew the contours, would we get closed loops, or would we get? You get this, basically. I, I should have put, I, cut, I took this figure out uh, because, well. It's just, it's just I, I'm, what I'm trying to explain is why it's particularly important what happens on that edge because of the shape of the contour line. Sorry, which, which edge? This so edge? You're or? explaining to us what happens where you get neutral drift along that edge. Yeah. And I'm trying to explain why it might be considered particularly important what happens along that edge, given the shape of the contours within the triangle. Because uh, that edge is a, a, a place that, other, that the flow tends to push you towards. Is that right? No. So the reason that what happens on this edge is, super, is extremely critical is that when you cross this line, the outcome changes. That it's as long as you're above this line, you're staying in here. As, and once you get across that line, you're going over here. Same thing is true on this edge, where you know, if you were to cross from there to there, you would get this qualitative change in the outcome. Yeah. But the issue is you don't move along this edge because you have buy stability on this edge. Mm -hmm. Whereas on this edge, you can have drift take you across the threshold, and then all D dominates. This edge would be just on the edge, right? Um, I mean, I guess literally, but. I mean, in a in replicator equation, that's how it will happen. Right. Um, but stochastically, it, it just, it just yeah. feel, I don't want to harp on this if it's not useful, but it would feel like a minor point if the edge occupied an infinitesimal amount of area because mm -hmm. the likelihood of being on the edge. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you always wind up on this edge. That's yeah, yeah, okay. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's, the, that's why yep. the shape of that arrow is so yep. important. Got it. Is because what it's indicating is that although the edge itself occupies an infinitesimal amount of area, you always wind anywhere up there. within that upper left triangle is going to push you to the edge. Right. And then once you hit the edge, you're in a drift zone. Right. So you could say that uh, tit, uh, all C is like tit for tat's Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So because of the mutation, there is no like neutral frontier between those two regions. Is that right? I guess that, I guess the old frontier between the, the all yeah. So mutate right, right. So basically, once you add mutation. Uh, things that you never get equilibrium in the sense that it, a population gets somewhere and stays there because right. mutation is always perturbing it and so then you get into a more world where you're saying in the long run how long does the population spend in different states and stuff like that something I'm having trouble understanding kind of relating this to real world situations is if usually there's like there's a generation of one mutation and it's going to have to beat some in the simplest version like there will be a mutation that's going to push you in one of the Mm -hmm. But if you imagine a bunch of new mutations that are kind of normally distributed between just a minor between all different strategies, mm -hmm. couldn't that produce long period of stability? Doesn't that doesn't doesn't that often describe mutation and like big real population? Yeah, and so is your point that with local mutation, that is with mutations that are only a small perturbation off of the existing strategy? that it's unlikely that you'll get a very different strategy which is then able to invade, something like that? Um, more just that if the idea is that uh, a perturb, like a mutation would be a perturbation, it would eventually some stability push you in one of these directions over time, so there's instability. If actually there's a bunch of mutations that are kind of, normally, they almost cancel each other out, and that makes sense. Uh, I guess, I, 
another way of phrasing it is just if instead of one mutation per generation, there were a bunch of them that themselves are wrong. Yes. No, not really. So you can have also have an update rule where every agent updates every generation, and so it's possible for a lots of mutations to occur at once. And like in general, at least for well mixed populations, doesn't make any difference. Um, you can get into some structured populations where it does. But okay, so I'm going to switch to another thing um, that is work that Adam and I have done. That's more sort of Adam Bear and I that's like uh, taking this into a more psychological domain because so far basically all the psychology has been missing, all of psychology has been missing from any of this where it's just agents with hard-coded strategies and what do they do? Um, and so <coughs> we uh, took the sort of dual process uh, thing, which these are, this is one hour after my identical twins were born. Uh, this guy is very calmly considering the world in which he's in, and this guy is just like, <laughs> going with his gut, let's say. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we wanted to use the intuition deliberation type framework uh, to think about cooperation. And this is something that um, Fiery mentioned briefly in the, uh, I think, in the in the first lecture. But you can think of this as, uh, you know, is it cooperation requires rational self-control of greedy impulses, in which case it's the deliberative guy, uh, we'll call him Isaac, uh, that, uh, <laughs> that is the sort of hero of cooperation, or is it that you're intuitively cooperative and rationally selfish, in which case Miles is the one that is really uh, bailing us out. And this is the thing people have argued about for, you know, at least till Aristotle or something like that. Um, and there's been lots of empirical work uh, on, but there hadn't been any actual formalizing of the theory. And I think it's, this is an example of why that's really important, is that uh, this is paraphrased from the, or this is pulled from Kahneman's uh, uh, dual process review, that like when people talk about dual process, there's lots of different dimensions that are pushed down onto one dimension and like, it means different things to different people. And so the nice part about the formal modeling is you have to be explicit about exactly what it is that you're talking about. And what we said, we focused on the fact that like, on one hand, you have a slow learning versus flexible distinction, um, which is to say that the benefit of deliberation is its flexibility, its ability to be sensitive to the details of the situation that it's facing. But on the other hand, deliberation is costly because it's slow, uh, it requires exerting control, and it's effortful. And so uh, our uh, formalization or operationalization of the sort of dual process concept is a trade-off between ease and flexibility, uh, where you have um, automatic responses that are low cost but low flexibility, and you have controlled cost or deliberative whatever responses that require paying a cost in exchange for getting the ability uh, to be more flexible. And so we take that general uh, framework and we put it into the context of cooperation in which we imagine that sometimes agents play one-shot prisoner's dilemmas where defection dominates cooperation. There's no payoff maximizing re reason to cooperate. This is what I'm gonna call pure cooperation, and by that I just mean the prisoner's dilemma. Um, and that happens a lot, but also, as we were just talking about, sometimes repeated games happen. And in repeated games, it's not a social dilemma anymore. Defection doesn't dominate, it's a coordination game where you, know, you have the cooperative equilibrium and the, the non-cooperative equilibrium. And so here, there is a payoff maximizing reason to cooperate, if the other person is also going to cooperate. And I'm going to call this strategic cooperation. And the idea is that as you are having interactions with different people in the world, both of these kinds of things happen. And so we say with probability p, you play a coordination game. And with probability 1 minus p, you play a social dilemma. Um, and this is just the standard prisoner's dilemma payoff matrix. And for the coordination game, at least in the main text, we do the simple version where we just set the off diagonals to zero, um, uh, which is sort of like the average per round payoff in an infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma, which is basically just saying that the, the exploitation of tit for tat by all D gets washed out by all the future benefit, um, or basically by the, the protecting and switching to zero, whatever. This is basically a model for all of the things that say 
when a defector exploits a cooperator, the cooperator is insulated from that exploitation, so the cost goes away, and also the defector is prevented from reaping that benefit uh, either through explicit punishment or through denial of future cooperation, and so the benefit goes away. Um, and so here, each time you're playing a game, it's one of these two types of games, and either you can deliberate, which means you pay a cost in order to get to condition your strategy on which type of game you're playing, or you can use your intuition, which doesn't cost you anything, but doesn't let you to condition. So you just have to say, like, well, uh, either I'm cooperating or I'm defecting, and I don't know which type of game it is. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> what that means is that you have a strategy space where, uh, oh, right, as I should say, the other thing is that the cost that's required, uh, the cost you have to pay in order to deliberate, we assume that varies trial by trial. Um, and we just uniformly sample it from an interval zero to some parameter d. Um, and so an agent strategy is what's the largest cost that they're willing to pay in order to deliberate, which we're going to call t for their deliberation threshold. And then when they use their intuition, are they going to cooperate or defect? When they deliberate and realize it's a social dilemma, are they going to cooperate or defect? And when they deliberate and realize it's a coordination game, are they going to cooperate or defect? What, why did why the last two? I mean, like, why not just this? You don't really need it. When we did the equilibrium calculation. But, but this is an important point that, like, the, the philosophy of, for me anyways, of the evolutionary game theory is that you're not ever supposed to, that is, the beauty of it is that you don't have to make any assumptions yeah. ahead of time about what are good strategies or not good strategies. And so I actually feel pretty strongly that we often have intuitions about what are good strategies or not, but that's not necessarily right. And so I feel like pretty strongly that you, in your simulations, you always want to give, you choose whatever complexity of strategy space you're going to make available, and then you want to have every strategy in that strategy space so available. Yeah, and I have this paper um, that uh, I doubt will get talked about this in the thing this afternoon, where but we show like for punishment, there was this workshop. If you add punishment to cooperation, that stabilizes cooperation, and it's great. But like they only put in punishment where cooperators punish defectors, and we showed that if you put in the full set of possible punishment strategies, basically they said, well, we won't consider defectors punishing cooperators because that doesn't make any sense. But it turns out if you put that in, it totally changes the outcome. Um, so it's important to not constrain your choice ahead of time. And so what this means is that over the course of uh, any given round, uh, the first that at any time two players interact, what happens is first you randomly sample how much is deliberation going to cost in this round, and then if that cost is greater than the agent's threshold. Then they say, OK, I'm going to use intuition. I'm not going to pay the cost. Uh, but if, if that cost is less than or equal to the threshold, they say, OK, I'm willing to deliberate this period. Yeah, yeah. And then either it turns out to be a, a, like a social dilemma or a coordination game, um, with probably 1 minus p or p, respectively. And now this is the key part, which is that if you used intuition, you just have to use your strategy SI your intuitive strategy, regardless of whether it turns out to be a one-shot game or a coordination game. Whereas if you paid that cost D star, you get to pick a different strategy depending on the game type. And so if you analyze uh, this strategy space, um, which is a little bit more complicated than we've done before because it's got a continual, this is like T is continuous, so there's an infinite set of possible strategies, but you can do it one way or the other. And it turns out there's only two possible equilibria. One of them is the equivalent of the always defect strategy, which is intuition is to defect, and its threshold is zero, which is to say it's never willing to pay any cost to deliberate. It just defects no matter what, and that's always an equilibrium. But then there's also a dual process cooperator strategy whose intuitive response is to cooperate. Uh, and when they deliberate, uh, if it turns out that it's a coordination game, they keep cooperating. But if it turns out that it's a, a prisoner's dilemma, they switch to defecting. And the maximum cost that they're willing to pay to deliberate is c times 1 minus p. Uh, and what that means is that if you think about what's the value of deliberating for this strategy, uh, it's only useful to deliberate. That is, deliberation only changes the action 
when it turns out that it's a one-shot game, because when it's a coordination game, it just sticks with its intuition. And in the one, that's, so with probability one minus p, it's a one-shot game. And by switching from cooperation to defection, the strategy avoids uh, paying the cost c uh, to cooperate. And so c times one minus p is the expected gain to avoiding cooperating in one-shot games. And given that that's the expected gain from deliberating, or rather, given that all deliberating does is lets you avoid wasting C in one-shot games, and the expected value of that is C times one minus P, the greatest cost you should be willing to pay to deliberate is that expected value. Uh, so this sort of emphasizes that all deliberation is doing is letting you not, uh, not cooperate when you don't need to. Um, and this strategy is Nash if P is greater than uh, C over B. And so remember, P is the probability that it's a coordination game. So basically saying, in a world where it's sufficiently likely that it's going to be a coordination game, then it can be an equilibrium to say, let me essentially assume it's a coordination game and cooperate. But if it's not too costly to deliberate, let me check. And if it turns out that it's actually a one-shot game, let me switch to defecting. Um, and so uh, this is just showing as a function of P and the benefit to cooperating, which of those two equilibria is risk dominant. And it's basically like, you know, if, if it's mostly one-shot games and or cooperation isn't very beneficial, then you should just defect. But as long as cooperation is, is sufficiently beneficial and it's likely enough that it's going to be a coordination game, you should have this intuitive uh, cooperation. Um, and then these are sort of isoclines for uh, values of t. That is to say, uh, everywhere along here, t equals 0.6. Everywhere along here, t equals 0.2. So the point is, once you're in the dual process cooperator regime, the more likely it is that it's going to be a coordination game, the less likely you should, the less you should be willing to pay to deliberate, because the less likely it is that deliberation is going to wind up being useful. Because if it's only useful for, for detecting one-shot games, the less one-shot games there are, the less useful it is. And so, uh, so just to show this, I'm going to take a slice. I'm going to fix B equals 4 and show you this is the results of actual evolutionary dynamics rather than just the, the Nash calculation or the risk dominance calculation. And what you see is that when, and, uh, and uh, to uh, Adam's point, it's always the winning strategy always when it's a coordination game cooperates and when it's a uh, one shot, when it's a prisoner's dilemma, it defects. So I'm not going to show those strategy parameters because they're boring, but I'm going to show what's the intuitive response and what's the maximum amount that they're willing to deliberate. And so when it's mostly one shot games down here, you have the all D strategy winning, and so both of these things are zero. They don't defect and they don't, sorry, they don't cooperate and they don't deliberate. Uh, but then once you pass some critical threshold, it switches to the dual process cooperator strategy, and so the intuitive response jumps up to one, and now all of a sudden they also like to deliberate a lot. But then you see, as the probability of coordination games increases, uh, the amount that they deliberate decreases because it becomes less and less useful. And so you get this kind of sawtooth, uh, sawtooth pattern. And so uh, one implication of this is that if you do individual differences in deliberativeness predicting cooperation, you shouldn't necessarily expect to see a consistent correlation because you can have non-deliberative people either because the world is all one-shot games or because the world, their world is all coordination games. And down here, you've got non-deliberative defectors. And down here, you've got essentially non-deliberative cooperators. Um, and then the other thing that's cool about this is here what I'm showing is just the fraction of the time that people cooperate, what, that the agents cooperate when they're in coordination games versus social dilemmas. And so, you know, when you're in the world of all D dominating, just nobody cooperates anywhere. And then as soon as you get enough coordination games around that the dual process cooperator is the winner, you jump up to basically always getting cooperation in coordination games which matches up with real world. Like in repeated games, when you know that there's a strategic reason to cooperate, people cooperate. And that's not surprising. The thing that as psychologists and behavioral economists, everyone is always wanting to explain is why do people cooperate in one-shot games even though it's against your self-interest? And so the cool result here 
is that if you look at what happens in the social dilemma of the one-shot games where it's not self-interested to cooperate, uh, remember the reason that uh, the way that the dual process cooperator strategy will wind up cooperating in a one-shot game is when they don't deliberate, right? Because their default is, is to cooperate. Deliberation makes them switch to defection. And so the less likely they are to deliberate, the more likely they are to wind up cooperating when they wind up in social dilemmas. And so what this says is the thing, the feature of the environment that makes you cooperate in social dilemmas is basically how likely it is that it's not a social dilemma. Like the more likely it is that the game you're going to play is not a social dilemma, then the less, like, the less worth it is to check whether it's a social dilemma. And so the more likely you are to wind up cooperating, even though if you had checked, you would have defected. And so this basically shows how the thing that it just, this gives a formalization for the statement that the reason people cooperate in one shot games is because usually people are playing repeated games. And, and because it's costly to figure out. Right. Right. And so just to say the strategy again, intuition is to cooperate, and then if they deliberate and they realize they're in a one shot, that is because it's usually repeated games, intuition is to cooperate. When they find themselves in the one shot games and they deliberate, uh, they switch to defection. And so this predicts that uh, if you were, so that the deliberation should undermine cooperation and. Uh, pure cooperation, like in social dilemmas, but it should support cooperation in strategic cooperation settings. And so there's evidence for this uh, from lots of experiments where with these economic games, people are given money and they can pay a cost to give a benefit to the other person. Um, and some of them are like one-shot prisoner dilemmas or public goods games where there's no uh, incentive to be pro-social because the other person can't respond, or like player two in a trust game or something like that. And so there it is this pure uh, cooperation. And in other ones, it's strategic where you do something and then your partner can respond. So depending on your partner's strategy, it might actually be payoff maximizing for you to cooperate in order to induce them to cooperate with you. Uh, and then the experimentally manipulate the use of intuition versus deliberation, either using time pressure, cognitive load completion, or these inductions where you just say, please use your, follow your intuition or whatever. Um, and so I had this paper last year in Psych Science where I meta-analyzed 67 of these studies, a total of 17,000 people, and as predicted, in these pure cooperation settings, you had significantly more cooperation in the more intuitive condition, whereas when people were induced to be more deliberative, they cooperated less. Whereas in the strategic cooperation uh, games or decisions, there was no difference between intuition and deliberation. Um, and in particular, if you look at just the raw levels of cooperation, uh, if basically what the theory is arguing is that the intuition is like a generalized response. That is to say, the, the reason you get more co pure cooperation using intuition than deliberation is that intuition makes you adjust to the details less. Uh, if you just look at the average amount of cooperation by uh, game type and by uh, you know, experimental condition, what you see is that in the strategic cooperation cases, there's a relatively high level of cooperation regardless of uh, the cognitive processing manipulation. Then in the deliberative condition, if you were to switch from a strategic to pure, you get this substantial decrease in cooperation because people presumably say, you sort of realize that it's a place where they shouldn't be cooperating. Uh, and if you induce people to rely more on intuition, there's less adjustment. Um, and so I feel like this is sort of empirical support for the, the overall predictions of the model, which isn't just in cooperation is intuitive, but it's like you should have this difference between strategic and pure cooperation where deliberation is making you uh, cooperate less when you shouldn't, but not when you should. And just as a side note for the people that have followed the uh, empirical roller coaster of this field, uh, there was, although I guess maybe people here know this because it's from your own thing, but um, so. I did the first experiment of this flavor in 2012, and then I had this meta-analysis, and then there was one of these big registered replication reports with like 20 to 1 different labs around the world that basically found 
you only get an effect. Uh, basically, the overall, not to get into the details of it, but the overall conclusion of the, of the registered replication report was not very favorable to this effect existing, but they had uh, a really low compliance rate where in the time pressure condition, only a third of the people followed the instructions and decided quickly enough. Um, and so then Fiery and Mina have a paper that just came out in JESP where they solve that and they get it back up to basically 100% compliance and they replicate the original effect and show it's robust and also works for outgroup members and for losses and stuff like that. Um, so, yay. So the last seven years of my life wasn't a total waste. <laughs> um, okay, so if there are four minutes until 12, uh, I could talk real quickly about the effect of network structure on cooperation, or I could talk real quickly about uh, this paper that Adam and I have with John Cohen that's coming out in Psych Review tomorrow about uh, cognition environment feedback and model where the parameters, the payoffs basically, aren't fixed, but the, the payoffs themselves change as a function of the strategies. Um, and we claim, my, my tweet for it was gonna be uh, why Obama's can, might, should be expected to be followed by Trump's. Um, so I guess from the intro, I revealed to myself that I'm more excited about talking about the latter than the former. Uh, so perhaps I will to, well, but it would be more altruistic of me to talk about the network stuff. Um, or you can spend four, four minutes talk, deliberating. Yes. Which one did you right yeah. to talk about what you're excited about? This All right. Strategy. Great. Okay, so uh, this is again in the automatic versus controlled processing domain. And here we're thinking of it not so much, uh, or explicitly not in the domain of cooperation and social dilemmas, but rather just sort of straightforward decision making, more like the uh, individual choice stuff that you guys have been talking about before with the general framework that uh, what controlled processing means is paying some cost in order to uh, have good decision making happen. Um, and we're going to normalize this sort of good decision making payoff to one, and you pay some cost C in order to get that good payoff. Or you could use automatic processing, which means you don't pay a cost but the quality of your decision making is worse. So your decision making payoff is only one minus P. And so that means P is this parameter of the environment that sort of specifies how useful it is to engage in, in uh, controlled processing. So it's, it's like the advantage of controlled processing over automatic processing, it just in terms of the quality of the decision. Um, and uh, so that is the basic setup, but then we also imagine that there's some degree of interactions between agents where in particular, the, to the extent that automatic processing is happening, that uh, decreases the relative advantage of controlled processing. It's basically like automatic agents impose a direct cost on controlled agents, and that could either be because uh, controlled processing is slower, so if automatic and controlled agents are competing to gain access to some resource, controlled guy is going to stand around thinking about what to do, and the automatic guy is just going to grab it and eat it, or whatever. Um, or it could be in the case that the controlled agents are they're doing long-run planning and assuming that they're going to have resources available for the future that they're using for their calculations, but the automatic guys are just running around wasting all those resources, and so essentially screwing up the calculations of the controlled guys. Uh, and so what that boils down to is that the, the payoff from using controlled processing is your optimal payoff, your optimal decision making is getting you one unit, but you're paying a cost of, of control to, to do your controlled processing, and then you're also having some fine uh, scaled by W imposed on you as a function of the amount of automatic processing that's going on. Uh, and whereas the automatic guys are just doing getting one minus p, they're just making their kind of crappy decisions that are crappy to extend p. Um, and so uh, then in this paper we have like seven different models where we you know make slight different tweaks on it and show that our results are robust to lots of different things. I'm going to show the agent-based model because that's what plugs most into what we have been talking about. And so here what we imagine is we've got this population of agents, and each agent engages in controlled processing of probability xi and automatic prob 
processing with probability one minus xi. So an agent's strategy is defined by this one x variable, the probability of using controlled processing. Uh, and if we let x star be the average value of xi across everyone in the population, so a measure of the total amount of automatic processing happening in the population, then we specify the fitness of agent i, whose strategy is xi, is going to be with probability xi, they engage in controlled processing, so they get 1 minus the fixed cost minus the w times the amount of automatic processing happening in the population. And then with probability 1 minus xi, they're automatic and they just get the 1 minus p. And so we could <coughs> just take that model and say, okay, who wins? But the, the main part that's supposed to be cool about this whole business is to imagine that there is it feedback between the environment and the population. And so uh, the different parameters in the model aren't fixed, but they can vary. And in particular, we, let <clears throat> uh, we, we imagine that one of the big consequences of controlled processing is not just that it makes you let, make better decisions, but it also lets you invent stuff um, you know, all, do all kinds of great rational thought and planning and whatever, and so it allows you to invent technologies uh, that make life easier. But critically, these are typically technologies that make life easier for everyone, both the automatic and the controlled agents. Things like refrigeration, antibiotics, you know, savings accounts, like, you know, whatever. Uh, stuff that, like, uh, is good for everyone. And so what that means is as these, uh, what these innovations do is by making life easier, uh, they make it less important to engage in controlled processing because uh, you know, it's, it's less important to plan for the future if things are more abundant now, uh, sort of uh, idea. This is really the core sort of assumption of the model that then we say, what are the consequences of this? Um, and so uh, what that means is the more controlled processing there is going on, so the, the higher the average value of x is, the lower p is going to be, where p again is the benefit. Now, uh, unlike before, unfortunately, that was unlike the previous models in this model, p, remember, is the sort of advantage of controlled processing over automatic processing. So the more controlled agents there are, the less useful it is to be controlled because they're creating all of these innovations. And then the idea is if the level of control decreases, the innovations degrade because people are misusing them and screwing it up and stuff. And so then p goes back up. Um, and so what that means is that in the normal evolutionary game theory thing that we talked about, what happens each generation is you update the population, right? Somebody dies, somebody reproduces. And so here, same thing happens, but in addition, every generation, the value of p changes also. And specifically, we say that the value of p in the current generation is take whatever it was before and add to it the difference between, so this is the amount of automatic processing, and this is what the current value, what the value of p was the last time. Uh, and so basically, if you didn't have, if you didn't have this there, that would just be, uh, you know, these two things would cancel out. And so you would just say the p is equal to the level of automatic processing, or one minus p is equal to the level of controlled processing. But now we put in this time constant such that Instead of P moving all the way from where it used to be to the level of automatic processing, it only moves a sort of tau fraction of, uh, of the way there. And so the tau is sort of like a parameterization of the lag in the influence of the population on the environment. Um, so uh, just to try and say that again, because it's really the core idea. Uh, you have the level of controlled processing is varying, and therefore the level of automatic processing is varying because it's just one minus each other. And if we imagine that controlled processing increasing means P, the benefit of control is decreasing, that means that the, the fraction of automatics increasing means P is increasing, right? That it, basically, P is tracking, if, if one minus P is tracking the amount of control, that means P is tracking the amount of automaticity. So this is just making it that it's like as the level of automaticity and control change, uh, P is following it around, but it's following it with some amount of lag, whatever. 
And so then you can say, okay, so what happens in this if we simulate it? And so here, if, you, if there's, in this case, there's no delay. It's just every generation P is equal to the amount of control process or of automatic processing there is. And what you see is we initialize it from a world where uh, P is large and X is small. So basically an inhospitable world full of automatic agents and very quickly it just goes to some equilibrium where for these particular set of parameters you have 40% of the population engaging, or ra rather the agents, everyone in the population engaging in control processing 40% of the time. Um, and then if you uh, increase the delay, what you start seeing is some little fluctuations around that. So it's still that the average uh, is 0.4, but you get little periods of more uh, control. And you see what happens is as the level of control goes up, then this P goes down. But once P goes down enough, then suddenly it's not good to be controlled anymore. And so control goes down, and then P goes back up, and then control comes back up, and you get these little oscillations. And then uh, if you put the delay up further, you get basically epochs of control followed by epochs of basically total like impulsive automatic uh, behavior. And you can more clearly see what's going on with the, um, with the feedback, where so it starts out, the world is um, basically, there's no control, almost everybody's automatic. And so uh, I guess in this case, we actually, like, maybe I should have initialized it there, whatever, it doesn't matter. Let's just jump into one of these. So here, you're in a world where everyone's automatic, uh, and and uh, basically everyone's almost entirely automatic, and so uh, the um, in f the sort of technologies that maybe once existed are getting overused and screwed up, and life is getting harder, and so the advantage of control is going up and up as the environment gets more and more screwed up, uh, until finally it gets high, high enough that the controlled agents suddenly start doing better than the automatic agents, and so control invades, and you get up to a period of uh, where most people are engaged in control processing most of the time, uh, and so that means that life starts getting easier and easier for the automatic agents because they're improving, they're sort of reducing the hardship of the environment until it gets so that life is so easy that there's no point in being controlled anymore, and the automatics reinvade, and you know the cycle starts again. I just thought, I don't know if this is a red herring, but if you flip back the slide, I thought I would point out something, which maybe, or a couple slides, uh, where you, you have your update rule for P. Yeah. Just point out that probably a bunch of you noticed, which is that the form of this equation is identical to um, uh, work prediction error update. Mm, yeah, this, right. Right, where tau is inverse alpha, and, um, uh, and then it, the analogy is between 1 minus x and r and p and q. Um, and there's, I mean, there's more in this model going on in that update equation because there's a relationship between p and x that isn't specified in this equation. Right. But probably the deep level similarity could be due to the lens of control theory of like using prediction errors to try to keep two variables in alignment, right? You're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, that's interesting. Um, if you did, if x wasn't static, then p would converge to x with a delay governed by tau. Right. But because there's an additional dependency between x and p that may update faster, that's not reflected in this equation, you're going to get this overshooting behavior, which gives exactly. rise to oscillations. Yep. Totally. Anyways, it could be another idea for a project if somebody wanted to explore: is there is there anything beyond a red herring, or like what is the deep level? Similarity between the role that prediction errors are playing in this model and the role that they would play in reinforcement learning. Could you construct a reinforcement learning algorithm where there was going to be some relationship between your value estimate and the reward that you actually experience? Which would be a peculiar, I don't know, is there anything like that in the real world? And if so, do different choices of alpha lead to oscillations in people's behavior? Um, I mean, here, here's an example where you're actually starting to just play this idea. Yeah. yeah. Over harvesting, say you're a farmer, so your value estimate of harvesting the apple tree um, 
is going to influence the future productivity of the apple tree. And so if you're over harvesting your apple tree, you're actually going to start to experience less reward from that apple tree in the future. And so that's defining a relationship between the rewards of visiting the state in future time steps and your current value estimate. But then it's going to be lagged by the amount of time that it takes you to learn what's happening to the apple tree. And so you can get these same kind of boom and bust cycles where you're over exploding the apple tree, you kill it, and then it rebounds, and you don't notice for a while, and then you notice, and then you over harvest mm -hmm. again. And that would be governed by a simple, uh, a similar kind of mathematical relationship. Totally. Yeah. Uh, and so anyways, the only last thing I was going to say on this is most of the models in this thing are, are replicator equation rather than Asian-based simulations. And to see the beauty and the power of that approach also. So the downside is you have to limit to just two types of agents, totally automatic versus totally controlled. But once you do that, you can just get a total closed form analytic solution for when are you going to get cycles? Like, what is the condition required to get cycles in this model? And it turns out that the delay has to be greater than this quantity. Um, and it's not super interpretable just from looking at it. But what you can do is you can plot for this thing where there's only two variables. This is the full for you know a, a full characterization of that condition. And so basically, it's it's uh, level sets where this is like everywhere along here you need tau greater than uh, this is in sorry this is actually log of that, so you need t 10. So here, tau needs to be greater than 10. Here, tau needs to be greater, along this line, tau needs to be greater than 100 to get cycles. Here, greater than 1,000. And so what this is showing you is it's comparatively easy to get cycles. That is, uh, you don't need that much lag in order to get cycles when there's not much of a fixed cost of control, but there's a large negative impact of automatic agents on controlled agents. Um, whereas as you sort of, and then if you increase either the fixed cost of control or uh, the impact that the automatics have, the sort of <coughs> delay that's required increases. And so it gives you some way to get a handle on, uh, rather than having to run a million different simulations and looking at how uh, parameters predict things, you can just say, well, here we go. This is everything. Uh, and that's everything. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, I hope that that was interesting, um, and I, I'm excited Adam will show lots of cool things and have you guys actually build this stuff, uh, build some of your own code on this in the afternoon. Um, I'll put these slides on the uh, whatever, uh, wherever it is on the if internet. You want to post some of the papers you talked about. And I'll post some of the papers. Like this one, I'm yep. sure people would love to see. I see lunches here. Um, and so, you know, this is your big chance to hang out with Dave for many of you. Sam and I are available a lot, but Dave not so much. So.